So, hello everybody. Uh, let's. We are about to start our webinar on the crowdsourcing platforms dedicated to historic images, uh, historic photographs. And um, uh, this is me, Vahur Buik from Maya Bike, speaking here. And I'm in the premises of um, a photo museum in Tallinn. So it's a branch office of uh, uh, br br it's a branch of uh, Tallinn City Museum, and they have been. Uh, kindly um, uh, hosting us today. So uh, IABike is not officially affiliated to the museum. It is run by, uh, by a non small non-profit organization called the Estonian Photographic Heritage Society. Uh, but of course, uh, the, the Estonia is a small country, so all, also the people from the museum are members of our uh, organization, our association, and, um, uh, and so we all uh, are somehow connected, of course. And it is exactly uh, 10 years ago, on February 25, it was a Friday then, that the uh, hackathon started, um, a hackathon from the series of hackathons called uh, Garage 48, uh, that was dedicated to uh, public services at that time, uh, and where the uh, crowdsourcing platform uh, Firebike was born. So it, it it took place over the weekend, over the course of 48 hours. So uh, it started in in, um, in the Friday evening, and and so uh, the first initial version of Wirebike platform was presented um, on Sunday. So uh, Sunday, February 27th, uh, can be considered as the birthday of Wirebike. And it is exactly on that occasion that um, uh, that I have uh, contacted people and uh, representatives of, of other similar platforms uh, from around the world to really to get to know each other and to learn about each other's experiences and, and also the platform more in detail. So I, I have been following um, uh, the platforms that there are that are dealing with historic images and, and crowdsourcing and uh, and so and I've been thinking about contacting these these other platforms for long, but now finally it was the occasion to to do that. And I'm really happy and, and honored that uh, all the all the people, all the presenters and moderators today have uh, have joined us and and are doing this uh, pro bono as a gift to Airbike. So. Uh, uh, really, really glad to have uh, Alexander Shatek from uh, Topotech, um, uh, Vikram from uh, Civil Photo, Civil War Photo Sleuth, uh, then uh, Stefan from uh, Snapshot, uh, John from uh, uh, from History Pin, presenting today. So we have presenters from Europe and US, uh, and and that's that's why also the timing or the schedule is such uh, that uh, that the live presenters from US. We can do their presentations early morning. The moderators I have met in, in person, and I'm also very happy to have uh, Sandra, Susanna, uh, James and Mia uh, joining us uh, to moderate the sessions. Uh, so uh, thank you all very much. Um, and um, so uh, maybe a couple of words about the um, the program also, uh, the idea is that we have all the presentations uh, starting at, um, at full hours uh, and then we have uh, 30 to 40 minutes for, for presentation and then Q&A uh, and then the, before each, each new presentation we have also a break, so 10-15 uh, minutes, uh, <clears throat> uh, but, but the stream will be on all day until the end of the event. Um, also, uh, so people who are, uh, who are following us on YouTube or Facebook, uh, if, you, if you post comments there, uh, these comments uh, will arrive uh, in the StreamYard platform where, 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 that we are using um, for this broadcast, so we can uh, we can see these comments, and also uh, the moderators can can see them. We have agreed with the presenters that uh, those who have uh, clear presentations ready, they will rather present their presentations, and then uh, we keep the uh, questions uh, for the um, Q and A session, unless there is really something that is uh, specifically about uh, 
uh, or some kind of clarification about what has been told. So also then uh, we can uh, interrupt uh, the present presenters and, and ask these questions right away. And um, I uh, really encourage everyone, everyone to use this commenting and also you could uh, you could even uh, use just uh, some some comment uh, now or maybe just comment where are you uh, where where are you following us from and if the stream is okay so that we can uh, see that the system is is working so uh, who who will be the first one to from our viewers to to who's brave enough to to comment <clears throat> and um Okay, what else? Um, so, um, <clears throat> well, so the first session, yes, is, is now about to start. So it, it will be about the platform of Austrian origin, Topotech, uh, presented by uh, Alexander Shatek and, and moderated by Sandra Fokonje. Yes. Okay. So, uh, and let me let me also display. We got. Uh, uh... Sorry, I <laughs> I take um, myself out from the stream for a moment. So. So yes, we have Stefan commenting also that the stream is okay on, on YouTube, and this, this is the way uh, we can actually display the comments in the in the in live. And now it's uh, full hour, so without further ado, uh, do I will add uh, Sandra and uh, Alexander to the stream and remove myself and the floor to view. Thank you, Wahur. Uh, it's my great honor. I'm Sandra Fauconnier. I'm an active Wikimedian, used to work for the Wikimedia Foundation, and I'm a freelancer in the cultural sector. Um, I will be your moderator for this hour, um, and um, the speaker in this hour is going to be Alexander Shatek, uh, who is the founder of Topotech, uh, a crowdsourcing platform that has as a motto, help private sources go online. Um, Actually, I've dived into Topotech a little bit. It's a really impressive project, has uh, been founded also already quite a long time ago in 2010. And if I, I'm counting correctly, it's already available in more than in 13 countries uh, around Europe. Um, Alexander will tell a lot more about it in the upcoming, I think, 30 minutes or so. Um, just practically, before I give the word to Alexander, um, I will repeat a bit what Vahu said in the beginning, but maybe for people who just join. Um, Practically, um, I would like to ask everyone who has a question or wants clarification to use the chat function, either in Facebook, if you're following through Facebook or in YouTube, I will keep an eye on that. Um, I prefer to keep the questions till the end. So when Alexander is finished, I can then relay the questions to him and we can start a QA. and a And a second practical thing is that we have a full hour scheduled for this session. We don't need to fill the hour, so we might stop a bit earlier so that people can get a drink, can get, some, can, can get a snack, and then the next session will start at an uh, hour again. Um, without further ado, I will give the word to Alexander. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Sandra, for this uh, good introduction. Um, well, it, it took a long time, of course, like I think all of your projects to get acceptance uh, outside. And so it took a long time from, let's say, 2008 up to today when uh, we started with just uh, very few uh, test uh, platforms. And uh, now it's running even more quickly because it gets the interest by the neighborhood of the people. They say, oh, the municipality near of us, the village, they do it. Why don't we do it? So that's the way we are spreading it. Uh, but before I think, uh, let's have a look uh, in it so that you can have an impression on how it is uh, built up and uh, what is the structure of Topotec. So, can you see, Sandra, can you see my, my screen now? 
Yes. Because I, I do not oh. have marked it uh, with uh, colored edges or something. So I, I don't know if it's visible. So thank you yes. very much. Uh, this is our main page here, uh, but this is not the actual archive. We have a lot of archives uh, in the villages or for all the people who want to run such a topotique. Um, and this is just the landing page where you have the news, even uh, the, the Today uh, workshop we have uh, here. It's in English. Uh, you see what new archives went online and on the bottom uh, in the footer, you have the lists of uh, um, the certain uh, specific archives uh, that are running. Uh, and when we want to jump into one, uh, you can also do it on top here. Uh, you get uh, the map and uh, we have the locations of the archives here. So, for example, we can navigate to one of these. Uh, this is the one I started with, so I'm quite familiar with this one. This is in Vienna, and it's in the second district, uh, and it's not one of the usual ones because there's no official structure. This still runs privately, but all the others are run by municipalities. So what can we see when we jump into such an archive? Uh, we have a sort of uh, um, categories here. Uh, we can switch this uh, to English too. So it's better to explain for me. Uh, here we have the images, we have the videos, we have objects, we have texts, we have documents, and we have the question mark. So if somebody uh, wants to answer a question, uh, it can be done uh, via the platform. Um, because it's important for us that uh, we have not an open gate. We need uh, um, the 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 people working uh, in, in in the background that are known by the by the officials. Uh, so not everybody might share something because it depends on who is running this archive and he is responsible for the content. We could open it uh, if somebody wants it to, who runs such an archive, but. Normally, this is closed here. So you can select uh, by these categories. And our main field, of course, is that we have the tags here. Um, you can use certain tags in the foreground to have a look at, to make some suggestions for the visitors. But all our search terms are in here. So for example, you're looking up a place and, and you say this is, uh, for example, Part uh, 104, so you can uh, put it here and you get out from 13,000 results down to 254. And uh, when you don't want to look this up by random, you can say, I, I want the oldest or I want uh, when it was uploaded or whatever. You can look this way. So you can connotate everything you want. Um, and we do not have any rules what it is to do. And this is, I think, sort of our philosophy because we have a lot of laymen working. And so we must not give them too many orders how to work. So we keep it open and we hope to get good search results by a good search engine in the background. So this, for example, was for, for a place, or you can even go into everyday um, things like, um, let's look up sunglasses on a brille, for example. Even this is something you can see something on the timeline. On the timeline, you see uh, that when it's in the order of the oldest, sunglasses seem to start somewhere somewhere in the 1920s. And when you have a look at uh, the image um, in the gallery, uh, you see that all these things can be connotated in the uh, image. Uh, here's the man with the sunglasses. And uh, we even can show this uh, with map overlays. So this should be here and you see how this place looked like in former days. Um, that's 
what's enough, I think, on connotation for common visitors. Uh, and uh, we have to serve both sides uh, because it's not uh, scientifically set up what we do, but uh, we have to uh, service all the people in the villages working on their topo tips. So, for example, let's look up some other one. Uh, what, let's take uh, this one here. Uh, you see, this is just some village uh, running such a topotek in the country on the map uh, it's somewhere north of vienna uh, a small village here um but um, where's vienna here is vienna our capital and you see this is somewhere up in this region here uh, and they use it mainly for the people history. So when you want to, to look up some, some person, um, let's see what, what can happen. You see a lot of Marias, for example, and when you click on one, uh, you can get several pictures in this case there are two and you can pick out the people here wherever this uh, woman is even in childhood and this is important for the people out there in the country uh, to get all this personal history documented if somebody do not want to participate okay they can be asked uh, do you want to be in here or not and this is only possible in this um, small context of a village. Looking back at how we can uh, search, we can search by our search terms. We can, of course, search by our timeline. Let's look what uh, sunglasses are just between 51 and uh, 54. So this is just 26 results. And what we also can do, uh, if you don't want to uh, uh, look up something by by a term or by timeline you can say i'm just interested in a certain region and uh, when you want to see uh, what uh, images or documents are here from this highway in the city so you can get several pictures that are collected um, inside the search circle you you draw up uh, with uh, just the right uh, mouse click. Well, that's how it actually works uh, for the visitors. Um, import and upload is quite easy because we have a lot of elder people working in our topotics and we have to keep it very uh, low threshold. Um, even important is this because we need to have a clear uh, red line between this what we call saving resources, saving fonts, uh, and what um, the historic scientific uh, community does. Because this must not be mixed. And we say we just want to save the things that we can find uh, in the private households. So let's have a look at some arguments or something around uh, Topotec. Uh, so we will find it here, sorry, share screen, share screen, here it is, here it is, should be this one. So I think it's important to have some philosophy and uh, this philosophy is not something we had in the beginning, but it was something that emerged by using this kind of archive. And this is that actually uh, we have no institutions here uh, that, are, that have the order to save these private findings. And we think that these private findings should not at the moment, but somehow later on should go into um, public hands because it cannot be that you have it in, in some 
social media groups uh, that could be closed because of content that's not interesting uh, to the policy of them. Uh, and uh, so we, th this is the way uh, where, where a lot of things still go. So even it's important to have in, in the communities the, uh, the path clearly that people can say okay i don't need this old stuff but i know that the municipality wants it and that we have people in our village who want to collect it and even digitize this and it's it's kind of saving not just saving of the artifacts but also saving of the rights because it's hard to uh, publish things when you you are in a unclear right situation. Copyright is a problem and personal right is even a problem. And uh, the nearer you are at the people, the nearer you are on the place where the things come from, uh, it's, uh, it's easier to get these things into clearance. And of course, there are a lot of people out there working with these things and uh, we want to get this work to be done in the name of the municipalities to get it public. And at the moment, we have about 300 uh, municipalities using the system. Uh, but Topotec is twofold. There are two things that must not be mixed. It can be mixed or combined. On one hand, it's an archive. And on the other hand, it's the system, how it is worked with. Uh, of course, you can use a Topotec for your private um, reasons. You, you can do your own archive with it. Uh, we have some people using this for family history uh, that is not published um, and it's just private behind a password. But usually it's uh, used as a citizen science archive. Um, and uh, this is what you see in our lists here. Uh, I want to uh, get some uh, to, to tell you the answers uh, to Vahur's questions because I think it's a good system that uh, he sent these questions that you can compare and uh, we even can see our problems or, or our tasks uh, we have on about the same thing. Sorry, I have to switch this off. Uh, I didn't do this before. Sorry. Uh, well. His uh, first question uh, was uh, progress since launch. Um, of course, this one has, um, let's say, um, little fault. It started not as a university project, but uh, started as a private project. And this uh, had some effort. Uh, uh, there was some effort necessary to get this private project into uh, public view and uh, to make it from a project to an infrastructure because um, uh, I know we have sometimes the problem when you fill in some forms um, for for Topotec they, they want to hear the the end of the project but we are in an infrastructure that's growing and there should not be a project deadline. Um, where is it from? Even this is important. Uh, we are an association. Uh, it's Icarus. Uh, from the private beginnings, um, it went into Icarus to have a, a good embedment into same projects. And Icarus is uh, something that started out from a European project for digitizing um, old charters. Uh, where are we uh, in Europe, uh, in Austria? Uh, that's where we started with uh, Austria in the right upper part. This is called Lower Austria. We have uh, nine uh, states in Austria and this is one of it. And here we are in St. Pölten. This is the capital of the state. In Vienna, this is the capital of Austria. And actually, I'm in Wiener Neustadt. This is south of Vienna. So you get a little uh, orientation on where we come from. Uh, and the culture, Lower Austria, is um, a federal institution um, that uh, 
covers all cultural activities here. And uh, one important step for us was that um, they said in 2016 uh, that Topotec has to be something to be done in Lower Austria because there's no institution to do this to collect all these things uh, from private sources because they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the manpower for doing this small uh, puzzle work. And so it's the Lower Austrian State Archive who is in charge of the cooperation here. Of course, not in the other parts of our country, but here, this is the cooperation and they do the workshops with us and with all the topotickers, as we call the people uh, working in the topotics. We have this, uh, had this before Corona um, in, uh, in the state archive. Um, we, they do data backup additionally for the lower Austrian data. And this is a very important uh, point now. They say if a municipality do not want to keep the topotic running, the state archive will do it instead of them. And so this means that all the work that was done to set it up uh, in a village is something like um, an item in an archive because it must not disappear anymore. And so this is a very important backup for us to say even the state archive is behind it. At the moment, uh, we have a little more than uh, 300 uh, topotics, not 13 countries, as Sandra said, it's just seven countries. We have translated the surface and translating content would be a very interesting task. We have some workflow in our drawers, but uh, not the manpower at the moment to get this done, but we are looking at it. So in our home state, uh, there are 180 topotics now online and uh, several others to be prepared and actually technically working in the topotics. Um, I would as estimate little more than thousand people. All the others we have dropped out or are people who are just working in the background, not uh, working um, in our masks, but giving information and gathering information in the villages. At the moment, we have uh, 850,000 records. Uh, if you see this from an automatized standard, of course, this is not so much, but uh, when you take in count that this is something uh, that uh, visualizes uh, all items that were looked up, they were talked about, they were put by hand in the scanner, I think it's quite a lot. And uh, when we have a look at some small villages, it's, it's really great what's getting safe there and that couldn't have been done by, uh, uh, by financed people. Uh, question uh, on key features. How would I define a, a topotec? Uh, let's see uh, the two things we have, uh, two, two areas. We have the te technical and the organization side. I would say technical is the detail search uh, that you can search by keyword as we showed. Uh, you have the lists with um, special keyword words you want to highlight in your topotech or every other things of course are shown uh, in in the list uh, appearing uh, you can search by date uh, with the timeline and you can search by place as we saw on the map uh, and in the organization it's of course that we are local units uh, i often see the the, the efforts that um, institutions try to get selections by the people for a whole country, for a whole region. Uh, and I see this doesn't work. The people are even here with, with strong roots to their village. And when you say, uh, let's do it for our village, but our village has three parts. Uh, they say, mm, these others over there, uh, okay, it's the same sign on the road, but that's a different part of our village. We do it for our place here. So it's very small scaled. And this is um, the proof that it can work. You have 
to give the identity to the people and then they will look up their history. And organization here is that we do it with citizen science, otherwise it won't work. And uh, of course, therefore, it requires this low threshold workflow uh, we offer. Uh, and an important fact, of course, in organization is that we have the cooperation with the public sector. So it's something that the responsibility for each um, separate archive we show is by a community. So the people who work in a topotec are responsible for the things they do and they have to look up that there's uh, only correct information. Uh, what content type we have and uh, what origin of content type we are looking for. Um, as uh, we, we, we had a look at, uh, we have pictures, videos, objects. Uh, you can all these uh, uh, things have in here uh, as far as it's digitized, of course. And our focus is to show these private documents, uh, the private information. We even get a lot of uh, videos now with people just talking, uh, talking about the history. Uh, and that's uh, with a very uh, local focus. And this is important even for these people who are not interested in big history, but just interested in um, their own life and uh, in, in the life of the people uh, before. Uh, user pace and expansion. Um, well, user pace, we have to look at so two groups again. We have the workers and we have the visitors. Uh, and workers mainly are laymen in our topotics. And uh, the visitors, of course, are both. We have the people looking up their memories, their own family, uh, and their friends, and of course, historians um, to look up uh, certain events or situations on these places. Uh, and of course, uh, there appears this uh, a question between history and remembrance. Uh, when we get the picture like this, every institution would be very interested because this is our chancellor in the 50s and, and uh, even minister um, and he's at the worker strike uh, in, where, where a power station was built and uh, this is great politics for our country and they are keen to get such images. And on the other hand side, this might be some Andy Smith uh, with its kid spike at the fence post. So. Nobody wants to collect this um, when not having the institution, um, the rural roots uh, to this picture, and it won't be saved by our institutions. And so it's so important to have these things in some basket that's operated uh, by officials. Expansion, uh, how can we expand? Of course, we have two groups to, to talk to. Um, these are the local historians that they want to do that kind of work and they ask their governments or communities, we want to do it, will you do the publishing? And local governments, of course, we have to inform that this uh, kind of archive exists and that they make some agreement with the historians to work here together and, of course, to finance it. Successes and failures, uh, just with a few words. Uh, on the success side, I think it's the acceptance uh, by our authorities. Uh, very important for us uh, to be a member of uh, European Citizen Science Association uh, is, is a very nice thing to, to be in the big pool of all the others doing the same. And uh, uh, the success is, is shown that uh, we have this constant grow, uh, not even of items, but also of the archives. Failures, I, I would say, uh, was um, uh, getting the institutions interested in the things we do. Uh, and uh, it took me a long time to find out why they are not very interested in that. Uh, 
maybe and then hope in, in other countries it's different. But here I felt that it's hard to get interested in things that are not in-house grown, that comes from outside and should be used. And the second one is that all that saving of sources is not that interesting for the people working. Institution and people, these are two different things and there would not be congruent every time. Um, when somebody wants to do his exhibition or wants to do its, um, uh, its write a, a new book, uh, they all have enough uh, fonts in, in their basements. They do not need to do that kind of work. But on the other hand side, it could be a chance for operation, a cooperation. Role of social media um, is a twofold. Um, many institutions in Austria, I, I only can talk about Austria at the moment, uh, they rely very much on social media and they say, we do not want to do all that work, but people do it outside on Facebook. So uh, let's have a look at such a picture. Um, there could appear some problems with such pictures. Uh, who is in charge of that? How many pictures of that kind uh, would be a peer. So how about ethic and political correctness? Who is in charge of this? And uh, we also have uh, some strange rules when these are foreign channels. Uh, maybe a Facebook group is closed because there are too many swastikas, but this was history, or they don't like uh, connotations of the pictures. So this is why we should have this in official hands, not on social media groups, but on the other hand side, it's very important to have all these social media groups working because there's the information running and people can be uh, shown the entrance to the archives because these are for a long time and uh, the social media is mainly, I would say, for uh, chattering, but even for, for passing on information is very important and um, we do it and uh, try to strengthen even our social media network. Challenges for the future, um, where do we have our bottlenecks? Um, our main bottleneck I'd say is at the moment our poor scan quality from the layman. Uh, because we have a lot of cheap scanners out there, people buy this in the discount uh, shop and then they have these problems you see here. Uh, on the right side, this is a poorly scanned photograph and then the left side you see the artifacts. This is not um, suitable for archives and the worst things are all these edges uh, that are done by the smart filters, optimization it's called, and the cheap scanners do not have a dialogue to switch it off. You say, scan a picture and you get an artifact. You don't get what you expect from such a scanner. This is, uh, this is a, a bottleneck at the moment and we have to try to tell people to, to, to show them the problems. Uh, of course, there's uh, a problem in, in quality control in tagging. Uh, not everybody thinks the same way. Th this is good, but we have uh, topo tags uh, with um, very highlighted person tagging, and we have topo tags with a very intensive topographic tagging, but they don't tag people. So this is something you have to, to merge and uh, of course we, we lack the hyperlinks. Uh, when you want to uh, search all the dogs uh, in the old years in the village, uh, you, won't, you can't do it because they, they put in the specific uh, kind of dog but not the hyperlink dog. So this is something we try to uh, solve in the future with automatic connotation in the background. And what we in Austria have, this is really a lack, this is the knowledge of licensing. Uh, 
uh, we have a lot of collectors in the country. They say, this is worth my money. I did this collection all my life and I don't want to show it. But for the municipality, okay, I, I give it to you uh, in digitized form, but that's it. Uh, and we try to, to inform people, please give uh, good licenses uh, to the images that in former years it must not be asked and even if there's not earned money with it when it's uh, when community uh, writes a new chronicle or uh, makes an exhibition so this has to be available even in legal sense and uh, maybe a lack in in our um organization is that at the moment we don't really have the manpower for the participation in larger projects we have all hands full to do with uh, servicing the people outside it works pretty well this is okay but some additional uh, manpower for this would be interesting and maybe also for programming uh, it's very hard to find uh, it people uh, at the market um, in, in, in the country. So if somebody knows some someone who, who tries to, to get some other horizon to, to work in other projects like ours, we could have some work packages to give out, like for example, taking the videos is something we want to do uh, within the next half year. So these are small packages we can if outside. Sustainability is something that's very important for us because they all ask when we come to, to some place that's interested in doing a topo take, what will be in one year, how long do you exist? So in this case, it's okay that it took a long time to be uh, at the status we are at the moment uh, to say it exists for several years. But as you see here, it's important to have it financed and the way we finance it is not by a, a large bucket but it's uh, by the individual municipalities that they say okay it's not that much money we can afford this even uh, at, at the time uh, now and what will the future bring uh, our Main way we go, uh, this is a meter search. That means uh, that at the moment we only can search in one archive. So you go to one uh, village uh, uh, topotheque, you only can search in this one. And it's important to keep these borders for the people working it because they cannot uh, mix up all the tags and keywords from the others. They have to do their system in their region but for the visitors it's important to uh, can that they can search for their grandfather um, even in in the other villages or cities and that's why meta search is going to be um, we are pretty pretty far it's just the surface we have to um, do now even for the mobile um, devices tagging in video is something uh, that uh, will be done. Uh, editable text as primary data is something important uh, that you can change texts very quickly, but not the connotation texts, but uh, you have a text as uh, like a picture. So this is your document. Uh, when you have, for example, some, some description on, on some historic facts or buildings and you get new information now you have to change your pdf and load this up again this is uh, quite difficult of course tagging in pdfs is something that should also be done within the next half year uh, and an interesting uh, thing for us would be uh, to have this as i mentioned background thesaurus uh, means uh, we must not take uh, the work of the people. They want to take things they want to highlight. It has to be their work. But we can help them in a second layer to get something, even to, to look at the hypernyms, uh, to get it completed, that they do not forget things. And this could be 
automatized. And this we could do with such a background this hours. Uh, and um, if anybody of you works on the same tasks, maybe it's interesting to get in touch on how we could solve this. Well, thank you very much. This is from my side, what I think is important to, to show to you. Of course, if you're interested in how it works uh, in the background in administration, um, I can show you this uh, later or can send you some files where you see how the interface is uh, for the people working in. How is it with time, uh, Sandra? Time is very good, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, 38 past the hour, which leaves us ample time to answer questions. And we actually had quite a few questions in the chat while you were talking. Um, I think some of them have been partly answered already while your story was developing. Um, but I think we also still have some open questions and I will take the freedom to just go through them chronologically. Um, the first question that came up, and I think you partially answered that, is a question by Sophie Teugels, if I pronounce it correctly, I'm Flemish myself. Um, she asks, so you explained a bit about uh, privacy, copyright, etc. Um, are, she asks, actually, are the contributors of the content responsible for the rights clearance and how do you handle this? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we have... Um for for the rights uh, clearance um, the responsibility in the municipalities we gave them we give them information and a form uh, when they want to uh, have this on paper to get the clearance uh, from the people who donate the images um, and of course it's hard and of course it's a, a sort of a gray zone uh, where we warn everybody working in here that there might be problems uh, and they have to to check as, as good as possible uh, where the pictures come from and we have to look at two areas one area is personal rights that's quite easy and uh, the other side is of course uh, copyright that's pretty difficult and um, uh, we have gray zones, in fact, uh, and everybody out there has to decide how dark or bright uh, this gray zone uh, can be. Uh, but being out there in, on, on the origin of, uh, of the documents, it's the easiest place to get some clearance. When all this material would would have um, wandered uh, through markets and sold and resold, nobody knows where it comes from. Uh, in Austria, we have um, a very pretty situation on that because our our law has um, a deadline. 1931 means that for all photographic work. Not images, not paintings, not sculptures, only for photographic work. That everything that um, is, is, is uh, made before 1931 can be uh, freely used. And because Austrian topotics are based in Austria, so this can apply. This is what our laws also said so 31 is, is is a very fine deadline because we have a lot of images of course uh, you never will get the information on who did it because all the people died otherwise in austria you have the 70 years after death of originator and this would sum up to 150 years so uh, we have these questions uh, to be resolved uh, in, in the topotics outside, uh, but we give a lot of information and try to, to, to get the warnings where it might be dangerous. But in Austria, it's, as I mentioned, hard to get good licensing because people are not much interested in that. It, it, it's something that's uh, like driving in a car and you have to be interested in your tires. Uh, they want to drive. They don't want to look at the tires. And so it's, it's when we do a workshop uh, starting um, 
with the team, um, half of the time, I can say, is discussions on uh, licensing and, and, and the rights, because they're not aware of this. And we have to get them aware. That's a, the situation we have. But in fact, the responsibility primarily, uh, of course, is there where a topotech is run. And this is, is outside in, in the municipalities. Thank you for that explanation, Alexander. Uh, I can just say we could go on, on that topic for very long. I know on, as a Wikimedian, we also know that problem very much, uh, that licensing and and the whole privacy issue is, is quite hard for people who have to upload content and definitely not everyone wants to get into it. Um, it's, I, I, I think, a topic for a, a webinar of its own or maybe even a, a series of webinars. Um, but for the sake of time, I will continue with further questions that people have asked, they're quite diverse. Um, there has been one question, but I think you answered that one by Rob Davis, who asked, can I cross search between Topotex? And you're working on that, right? So that's the meta search. So I think um, if there are further questions, like more specifically on that, people can still ask them. Um, then next question that we had was by Olympia Kurta, who said, who asked, who creates the metadata for the images? I, I assume that, you know, when an image gets uploaded, who, or an image or a document who creates the metadata. Yes, yes. Uh, we do not have the Saudi, uh, so people are open to do it. Um, and uh, these people are the people responsible for their municipality topotic. Uh, so it's not open. We could open, but they don't want because they say our mayor is in charge of this. And so we have to know the people working in the topotech. Uh, and, and so these might be one person. Sometimes these are 12 persons, 16 persons uh, in, in, in Krems in Wiener Neustadt, uh, that's cities with 50,000 inhabitants. So it's, it's a larger group. Um, and they have to talk, of course, in the beginning, how do we want to tag? They have to think about the system, how to tag. We cannot co not compel them how to do it because we have a lot of um, historians or local historians who did that work um, for several years and they want to uh, use their system of, of tagging. What's important in, in a picture? It's so interesting to, to look at people uh, showing them the same photograph. And one will say, oh, this is a, a certain kind of architecture in this building. And the other one will say, oh, the, look at what, what this uh, woman is wearing, the coat. It's very interesting. Yeah. So we have to combine. Uh, we, are, we have just very few rules. I say, please do it that way. And that means do not use plural terms. Makes no sense. You have three and trees. It's double. Um, and to keep them short. Uh, not to say man walking with dog. This is not a key word nobody is interested in because you can, can combine it in the search box. It's man and it's dog. That's it. Yeah, but this is done by the people outside working in 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 their topotics. We can cannot centralize this, uh, and the information is important to get it from the local people because only they know what's in these pictures. Thank you for the answer. Um, you hint also a, a little bit that you know you have kind of like low-level rules on that, which is interesting. Uh, at the end of your presentation, you also talked about the thesaurus, maybe. Um, we have some questions coming up that will go more in depth on that. So now we are switching a bit more to more, uh, slightly more technical questions. Um, the first one is from Julien Rémy. Um, is, do you use any open standards like IIIF, web annotation standards, etc.? No, we developed this uh, without any input from outside and it evolved as it is now. And I think it's a good question uh, because it should make us think also to uh, get some... Uh, to, 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 to get in touch with uh, some standards we do not have here. Um, 
Yes, it could be interesting to have a look at this. And uh, if you could provide me with such uh, topics on that, uh, we could check. Because I'm always in search for, for standards and, and other things. Um, it's, it's on our schedule for this year um, to get good um, uh, connections uh, to other platforms. Uh, for example, um, for, for Europeana, uh, we could have um, uh, made the interface for, for, for several years, but we didn't activate it. We have it for Finna in Finland now. Uh, I hope soon working, so interfaces are no problem. But we have to uh, see it uh, to look at the standards that are important for this. Yeah, thank you but for the would help. Would help information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it make, makes a lot of sense. Your platform is more than ten years old, and you have created it. I think maybe more of the platforms that will, will be presented this afternoon have been created before IIIF became really important in the cultural sector. And so now there's probably the question for more platforms like this, how, how can we adapt, adopt more to standards that have become emergent uh, in more recent years, right? So I'm very curious about also about next presentations to what extent that will play a role. And maybe from this webinar, some you know uh, collaboration can come to can can come from that. Um, the next question is actually very closely related. At, at least I think uh, it's a question by Bob Corre. Um, in relation to linked data, um, can the thesaurus or vocabulary that you use uh, be used for input, or is all data a string? Um, I hope that question is clear. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, oh, not quite a mine. I'm, I'm not a technician, uh, but we do not use a thesaurus at the moment. Uh, I think that um, enables uh, the question. Sorry, uh, we, we do not have thesaurus, but we'd be interested in, in getting some. Yeah, just to... I add to that, uh, yesterday we had a preparatory meeting to try all the technology that we're using now. And we also had a, a bit of a discussion about your wish to have a thesaurus or at least a slightly more shared vocabulary that you know, not, not people are not forced to use, but that at least can be a basis for shared, shared terms. And um, I can imagine that that can also be a source for linked data between different initiatives. And I think the question by uh, Bob is also hinting at that, that if among crowdsourcing initiatives, you use similar thesauri, you use similar systems, then uh, you know you will also be able to link to each other's data and to other data out there. Um, so I think that might also be a source for discussion further during the afternoon. Um, then, um, yeah. Bob also just very kindly said that uh, he's very curious. Maybe it's not just a question, but a remark. And I, I think I want to highlight it. Uh, I also live in the Netherlands, so I, I think it's cool. I'll be sharing a link to this presentation in the hope that also Dutch heritage organizations will get interest. Has there been an, any efforts to promote Topotech in the Netherlands? Willing to help here? This is noted, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, great. Um, it has two sides. Of course, for us, it, it would be great to get more international, uh, to have more things uh, to be linked and, and, and a greater, uh, larger community. Uh, on the other hand side, uh, we do not have uh, the manpower to do it. And of course, uh, I do not want to, to get uh, in, in, in conflict with uh, local initiatives. Uh, so if there's place for it and somebody thinks, okay, that's exactly what uh, we want to use, uh, you're very welcome. Uh, and, uh, and to get uh, some, some contacts or if you, if you want to, to promote uh, something that we can, can provide, would be great. But I'm always very careful to, to have a look at are there other systems uh, that there's not some, some bad situation uh, in a country. But of course, for us, definitely interesting. Translation is not done in, in Dutch at the moment, but it can be done in, in about one hour. We have, uh, I think it's, it's seven pages um, just to, to type in. Uh, it, it's the surface. 
uh, and uh, with the thesaurus, of course, we could get into the ability to have content translated. And this is a great wish we have. Thank you. Uh, I'm also getting a notification from Wahoo that we're running out of time. Uh, it's now 53. I have one question left, um, and I think it's a short question, so we can just answer that one and then uh, call it a day for this hour. Uh, the last question is by Kerstin Arnold, and it's about institutions. Uh, it's interesting that you mention that it's more difficult to work with cultural institutions. Um, does Topotech have any experience if this changes when, for instance, having targeted activities, let's say in, around the local anniversary, do institutions then get more interested? Yes, yes. Uh, this actually is, um, is a point of time when they say we have to do something new. Anniversaries, for example, yes. So the younger generations in the institutions try to get some involvement in public projects, to get people involved uh, working, but they always are very aware of the red line. These are the outside people. This is our, uh, well, some tower, you know what I mean. Uh, this is, um, uh, I think, a generation problem, and uh, the younger people working in institutions do not fear uh, that contact. Uh, anniversary is, is something that often is uh, the starting point for Topotec, even in municipalities when they say uh, we want to give some historic overview and we want to uh, again say this is our identity in our village or, or town, then they start with it, yes. Thank you so much. Um, we are at the end of the audience questions. Um, I think we touched upon lots of themes that will probably come again in the next presentations. I think also the one about collaboration with institutions. I'm very curious to hear how other initiatives do that, if they do that at all. Um, so I would say stick around to the audience for the next, for the rest of what is here in the Northern Hemisphere the afternoon or in, in Europe the afternoon. Um, we can do a little break now and come back at, uh, yeah, the full hour for the next presentation. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you, Sandra.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Um, I am Susanna Ones, um, and I come from Finland. I um, am a GLAM coordinator at Avoin GLAM, which is a collaboration between Wikimedia Finland, Open Knowledge Finland, and Creative Commons Finland uh, to tackle open access to cultural heritage. And I am presenting Stéphane Le Corny, Le Corny um, uh, who is presenting Snapshot. Snapshot is a platform for geographical placement of historical landscape photos, and it has been live since 2017. Uh, it is developed at the University of Applied Science in of Western Switzerland. And Stefan is a software developer and project leader for the development of the Snapshot web platform. And maybe just uh, to remind you of some housekeeping things and rules, you should, um, uh, you're welcomed uh, to post questions in the YouTube or Facebook chat, and uh, we will collect them and uh, we will uh, process them and give us them to Stefan after his presentation to be answered. There's also a memo, uh, a collaborative online memo that you can. Uh, write uh, your comments and make notes of the discussions and uh, copy the questions and answers to. And I will uh, paste uh, the link to the Facebook chat through which I am communicating with you. So I will give the floor to Stefan. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. So I will uh, present you Snapshot. So it's uh, what we call the participative time machine. So it has been developed by two institutes uh, at the Applied Science University of Western Switzerland. So Med Media Engineering Institute for the Web Application Frontend and the Terrestrial Engineering Institute for the algorithm in the back end. So the principle is to have a platform for the geographical valorization of historical photographs of landscape. And then let's look quickly at what the goal of the platform is. And then I'll do a quick demo afterwards to show you what it is exactly. So currently the situation is we have a lot of uh, archivists that have distributed images uh, among different institutions, different collections, and so on. The images are not georeferenced currently, and they are not properly tagged. And on the other hand, there is like general public and many people that have a lot of knowledge on those places. Maybe they have lived, lived there, they have grown there and so on. So the goal of Snapshot is to bridge the gap between the two. And thanks to that, one additional goal is to help the scientists maybe to use the final uh, data that comes from Snapshot. So the images with enhanced metadata that are on a single places and with which are uh, geolocalized in three dimension. And then, so it could help, for instance, uh, to follow climate change. So that's something in Switzerland we can follow with a glacier. In the Alps, for instance, it could be used for urbanization. So like to check the changes in urbanization of the last centuries in the Alps, in countryside, in cities. Or it could follow natural hazard, like earth sliding and uh, similar situations. Now I would like quickly to present to you what really is Snapshot and the web application, so you can you can see by yourself, because I guess many people don't know Snapshot yet. So that's the current website of Snapshot. Uh, so you have two parts. You have Discover, where you can check the images that are already geolocalized. And then you have contribute where you can become a volunteer and localize picture. So we have around 500 members, uh, 100 and more than 170,000 geolocalized images, and it's live since 2017. Uh, we have currently a new challenge from the Library of Technological University in Zurich. So you can see there is like around 8,000 images to geolocalize and volunteers already did almost 70% of them. It was live, I guess, three weeks ago. So they are quite active. Uh, that's the first part of this collection from 1957 to 1999. And there will be next challenges to, to fill the 20,000 uh, pictures. 
so we have many collections. We have almost 30 collections right now. So you can see a quick overview here. And I want to show you like the owners of collections. So to summarize, we have like uh, two to three types of owners. So we have libraries, like the one from the Technological University or the Swiss Federal Libraries. We have a public institution, like the Federal Office of Topography. And we have archives, like local archive, cantonal archive, or federal archive, like here. If I switch to the page from the University of Technology Library, so it's an overview of what they do in their collection. And I want to show you quickly. Yeah. So you will see soon that's an overview. You will see an, an overview of Switzerland. It has to load the maps. I can zoom a bit, probably. So that's part of Switzerland, and the blue dots are the images that are geolocalized currently. So you can see there are already quite a few contributors and volunteers. And one thing that is interesting, I just wait for it to, to load. So once it's geolocalized in 3D, we can see, let's try to take one that's it's nice to show. We can see the view shade of the images. So it's the blue point is the position where the photograph was uh, to take the picture. And then the blue polygons you can see is the view shade. So it's uh, everything that can be seen on the picture. So it can be used afterwards by collection to, to get all the places that are visible on the picture. And here, maybe we can check this one. So for instance, this one. And you can see that there are some uh, white spots inside the view shade. So that's the places that are hidden by the, by the mountain. So that cannot be seen on the picture. Just a quick example again. And this one, you can see that you can see far away on the picture. So that's why the view shade is so extended. Now I want to show you a quick example of a picture when you visit the page and you click on a picture that has been geolocalized. So that's a picture from 1963 or 1970, sorry, uh, from some mountains in, the Switzer in Switzerland. And you can play with uh, the transparency and you can see that it's quite well aligned and quite perfectly aligned with the landscape and the 3D model behind. Uh, one thing that is quite uh, nice to see is you can also play with the depth of the image. So once the image is geolocalized, we have information of which part of the picture is at which depth. So currently you can you can play with the depth and see like the position of the picture exactly at what position in the in the 3D landscape. A quick example I want to show. So in Switzerland, we also integrated the 3D models of the buildings. So all current buildings currently are modeled in Switzerland. And so that's the uh, red buildings you can see here. And that's something, uh, like I said in the introduction, you could check urbanization. And like if you see the picture, on the picture there are no buildings. There were no buildings in 1990. Uh, but then you can quickly check the difference compared to nowadays where it's totally built with uh, buildings and houses. So that's one example of how it could be used. Now, how do people uh, geolocalize and georeference images? So I try to do a quick demo. <clears throat> so that's a picture in Lausanne near uh, Ushi. So that's the lake side of Lausanne. So I selected this image and then I click on new geolocalization. And it has to load the map. Let's wait a bit. Yeah. So 
So on this screen, I have to select the position of a, of a picture and the places that was pre-selecting according to the title was here. And let's say, I think it's more here, but it's more in the same place. So that's the first step. You have to position the place of the photograph. The second step is to decide the direction of the photograph. So it's something like that. And then we will load the 3D model of uh, these places uh, in Switzerland inside the viewer. And the goal of the geolocation will be to select points on the photograph. So we can zoom in to select some places on the picture and then select the same places on the 3D globe. So we'll have to wait a bit for the, for the globe to load. That's this one. So here, let's unzoom the picture. So you can already see that we, we can see these places here on the globe and in, here on the picture. So I can start. So I select a point on the picture, then I select it on the globe. <coughs> Sorry. Then I have to do the same for uh, some other points and I need at least four to start to compute a position from the algorithm. And then afterward, we will ask for six points uh, to, to be sure that the geolocalization is precise enough and good enough. And like this point, it's the last one. So now we send the computation to the backend that will uh, compute geolocalization according to the bonding point control. So those four points uh, I decided on the picture and on the map. And of course, the demo effect, there was something that went off. I'm on the beta version, so maybe something gets broken, like usually on beta version. But I try on a new one, and then we, I'll, I'll show you in another way else. Yeah, I think we have an issue on beta, but then I had a fallback, of course. So it's exactly what I showed you. So those three position. But here it's another picture, but it's the same principle. So the idea was to select uh, ground, counting, ground control points on the picture and on the map. And then after that, the algorithm can align the two images. And then so that's what I show for the visit of the picture. And you can play with the depth and the transparency. Now I want to discuss maybe a bit more on uh, the volunteers and some data, some numbers. So we have more than 170,000 geolocated images, as I said. It represents around 20,000 hours of volunteers' work. So we compute that on average, uh, you need like seven minutes to compute images uh, to your position. So some images are easy, some are more difficult to compute. Uh, it was around 1,500 images, images per month since the beginning of the project, and we have more than 560 members. So the community is quite active. So here I put a screenshot of the leaderboard, and you can, you can see the top five contributors. So the top one, the first person, he geolocalized more than 25,000 images. 
which is huge. So uh, we have really a community that is really active and eager to do localize a lot of pictures in Switzerland. And then the fifth one, it's almost, you localize almost uh, 10,000 images. And so that's for the top five uh, more most active contributors. Uh, but we have more than 100 users that you localize at least 10 images. So we have also a larger community behind those top five. But I think it goes in two ways. So we have an active community with active volunteers that are eager to geolocalize images. But on the other end, we need also to put uh, regularly activities on the website. So we have more than 30 or almost 30 collections currently with 170,000 images. And we try to put new collections regularly. Uh, so like every two to three months, uh, usually thanks to uh, the Library of Technical University of Zurich, we have a new collection with almost 10,000 images to geolocalize. So that's a way for people also to know that if they go randomly to the website, usually there is a current challenge with some images to uh, new images to geolocalize. So you can see this one was the current one I spoke about just before. Uh, we have a few which are on 99% complete, and usually it will stay on 99% uh, before we flag the other images as, as impossible to geolocate. Uh, some images do not have uh, much information. Sometimes it's an, only a landfill or some snow places in the mountain without much more information to geolocalize. So not all images uh, can be geolocalized but usually like around 99% for our collections. So uh, an example of some volunteers. Uh, so the one we know, we don't know all the volunteers, but the, the one we know are usually retired people that have a background in either uh, geo-information or IT. So they like computers, they like uh, trending technologies, and they like uh, geography and uh, geo-information. And usually they geolocalize the pictures around their home but they like also to try to geolocalize other important places. Uh, another interesting point is maybe how those, all those information are used afterwards. Uh, so we have many pictures, we upload them to snapshots and it's geolocalized, but then maybe what's the point after that? So uh, one interesting example is this view shed. So this is an example from the official map from the Federal Office of Topography Swiss Topo. So they have a lot of aerial images, and then they display the view shed on the map. So you can see on the left hand side, so you have those two legs, and it's really the two legs you see on the picture. So it's quite interesting because you can see uh, what is visible on the picture displayed on the map, and the other way around. If you select a point on the map, you could find uh, what are the picture where you can see these places. Uh, I didn't speak about them yet, but we have also partnership with Imagine Rio, so it's not only Switzerland. Uh, we have a few pictures in Austria with a foreign version, and we have a few pictures now, uh, a new project with Imagine Rio in Rio de Janeiro. And there are many historical uh, images. Something interesting for them is uh, you can see on the left side, it's their current website, so they're working on the new website. So they displayed some kind of footprint or view shed, but it's really a basic view cone, and they will uh, use our website to display a much more precise view shed so that you can really see uh, what is visible on the picture map on the map directly. We also developed a widget uh, with a 3D globe view that I presented you so that they can integrate it directly on their website for the picture that are already geolocalized. So they don't have to link outside uh, to snapshots, so people don't have to go out or to quit their website. Directly in their website, they could load the widget that shows the, the picture in three dimension. Uh, just an interesting point for, for Imagine Rio, they, they have a coastline that evolved a lot. Uh, so one part of the project was to integrate many different elevation models. So there are many historical elevation models that are uh, represent the terrain uh, at that time, and it's different from uh, beginning of 19th century and maybe beginning of 20th century. 
because they, they destroy some places or they took some places over the sea. And to be able to do localize in three dimension, as I showed you with the 3D model behind, we, we need a model that match the picture time. And maybe last example uh, for the Bibliotheque of Zurich, the Library of Zurich, sorry. Uh, thanks to this view shed, so once the picture is geolocalized, so this is a picture around the Valetju in Switzerland, and the title is only the name of this lake. And then, uh, thanks to the 3D geolocation, we can extract the view shed, as I showed you. And then from the view shed, we can know the relevant places uh, that are on this picture. So that's a quick uh, screenshot of our back office. And you can see that for this picture, we extracted uh, some geotags, like Col du Molandru, which is one of these call paths here. And it helps afterwards people when they do a meta search, uh, you can also search uh, places that were not originally tagged on the image, but places we could extract from the 3D position of the image. So uh, thanks to that, they can improve a lot their, uh, their search engine for places. Uh, now I want to put just a few in light of uh, this current research and work in progress. So the project is really like between geo-information and cultural heritage. So that's the really interesting part on working on this project. And it was a question from the previous presentation, but uh, so actually uh, many owners, so it was, not the, it was not the case at all like five years ago, uh, but now many owners, they have a tri IIIF server or they are thinking about switching to IIIF for hosting their image. So currently, for most of the owners, we host the image on our uh, server. But for uh, Rio and Imagine Rio, they already have a triple IF server, so we connect directly to their server. And so we can use the tiling from their server, we can display images directly from their server. So it's much easier for them to import uh, their images uh, to Snapshot. They don't have to upload gigabytes of data to our server. We can just uh, import some metadata title, and then we can directly uh, publish the images on Snapshot. And this one, we are also part of the map working group for IIIF, where we are uh, thinking about integrating some geo information directly in the metadata for IIIF. And so Snapshot is a use case we presented to them to try also to integrate like 3D, maybe 3D geolocation or to discuss how it is best to integrate uh, geolocation inside the metadata for IIIF. Uh, another direction of research we have right now, so something I forgot to show, but people so they can, on the website, they can also edit a title uh, or description so they can edit the metadata if they, if they find something is wrong. And they can also draw observation on the image, uh, like some relevant places or stuff like this. So currently it's free text, so they can draw a rectangle on the image and they can input free text. Uh, but one idea would be to link the data directly to Wikidata, so to have a basis uh, reference and not, uh, so we would be sure to have like common references between all observations, which so would be a bit easier than to, to use the observation. Currently it's only free text and it has to be processed afterwards. And last point, I think that could be interesting for many people. So we are open sourcing the API and the, the 3D viewer for this project. Uh, it will be done in the next following months. I'm not sure exactly, so we are still in the process of uh, finalizing the documentation and everything. And uh, in addition to that, we will uh, make a public API. So the API will be uh, in open access uh, with the public documentation. And the idea is in that way, uh, maybe scientists or other websites, other people could use the data from Snapshot to try to create new experiences 
uh, to try to check uh, scientific results. Uh, so that's really the, the current goal of the project is to try to, to make it open source and have more people use the, the data from Snapshot. Uh, so thank you. So that was it for my presentation, quick presentation. Uh, and now I'm happy to answer any questions there were in chat. Thank you, Stefan. That was super interesting. I have uh, I have not been as uh, astounded as I was uh, with seeing this um, spatial um, gradual uh, disappearance of the photo. <laughs> it's really um, remarkable. We have a few questions, and I, I was thinking that we might um, address um, them in order from less technical to more technical. Okay. <laughs> and actually, I have... <clears throat> I have, uh, well, actually, the very last question that was from Sophie uh, is that can, there's a, there's a blocker here on my text, I will, uh, can citizens make contributions? Yeah, so currently anyone can register to Snapshot and you can even uh, contribute anonymously. So you don't need an account to contribute. Like anyone can go to the website and can geolocalize uh, pictures, uh, can uh, improve metadata and so on. So either you create an account and you can see the history of contribution you do, or you don't even need to, to create an account. But currently the picture, uh, they only come from a public institution or library. We don't allow yet people to put their private uh, pictures online. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe then I think we should address the whole question of openness. And there's a, a question from uh, uh, now. I'm not sure. Is it Cherstin? That how we would say in Swedish, or anyway, uh, Cherstin Arnold, uh, who is uh, asking: Is the widget uh, developed uh, uh, available as open source, or did you specifically develop it for the cooperation with Imagine Trio? So yeah, so the widget will be part of the open source uh, we will uh, publish. So there will be the API and this uh, 3D viewer that will be open source like in the coming months. I do also have some, some questions about openness. Actually, there are many, many, many different le levels and, uh, and details for openness. Um, first, uh, I think the question is uh, related to the openness of the materials. So um, how is it with the materials that the uh, institutions contribute? Are they open by nature uh, or are there different uh, levels? Uh, for the pictures, you mean? Uh, yes. Uh, so I don't know if... Uh, so uh, each image comes with, with a license. And if we take this one, so most of the image from uh, the Bibliotech Zurich, they come in a Creative Commons by license. So that's a choice from the institution. So Zurich uh, Library decided to go with this license. And then most of their picture, they are already in this license. And depending on the owner of the picture, we keep the license they want to, to publish the image with. Yes, thank you. Um, I think uh, we might uh, well, maybe I will ask again first about the, the Wikidata um, screen that you showed. You then seem to participate in the uh, in the Wikidata community in in doing this, and I would like to ask what kind of um, uh, data do you share there, or how do you how do you work in in connection with Wikidata? Yeah, so we don't participate yet. Uh, because it was not on the top priority, but it's something that is in our pipeline. So we investigate a lot of standards. So we have another project where we are, we are looking about standards to share information, also for the public API, to know in which format to share mainly the geo information, like the 3D model of images and geolocation. But when we went uh, in that direction, we started to go in the triple IF standard, and then we started to go in the link data, mm -hmm. and then in the Wikidata standard. Uh, so we have a lot of standard we would like now to integrate, and Wikidata is part of that, and every link data that goes with it. So instead of having uh, observation or metadata that are 
just link to that picture. We would like to go in the link data way and link everything together. And ideally, we probably uh, Wikidata to have also more information on each uh, element in the picture. I think there are many people in this call who are very interested in that. Right. Um, I would uh, then uh, take the question of uh, Julien. Um, he asks, uh, do you leverage uh, other IIIF APIs than the image API, like the presentation API? So currently, no. Currently, we only use the first uh, the image API. So that was the first step for IIIF currently. Uh, there is no plan yet to integrate other parts. Uh, but since we are looking uh, on those observations to also integrate Wikidata, and then probably at some point we would like to integrate observation from IIIF directly or so. I actually also have a little bit technical and uh, practical question. Something mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, about um, making it more global or, or historical. Both I'm thinking both terms like wide and deep. Uh, that what are the bottlenecks? What kind of resources are there uh, available in different parts of the world or for different different times in history? And uh, like where where do you see? you can go and where are the bottlenecks in, in expanding to these directions? Yeah, so in order to do the geolocalization part I showed, we need the, the terrain model. So we need the elevation model of the Earth uh, at that time. So usually it doesn't change so much, except maybe your Rio de Janeiro, where, where it changes a lot and where we need different elevation model. And uh, we need the imagery, like satellite images also for, for that places. So in Switzerland, we use data from the Federal Office of Topography, which is really precise uh, and that we could get as part of the university. Uh, from Austria and Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, we receive the elevation model from our partners there. And we have a global worldwide uh, coverage, thanks to Bing and Map Tyler, but the precision is not as good. So it will be probably enough to geolocalize images, but the precision will not be as good as the one I showed you. Uh, so usually a partner, they try to get a precise elevation model from their country and to, to send it to us so we can integrate that one. Yes, and uh, we have more questions here in the chat now from uh, Vahur uh, wants to ask, um, more precisely, is this project academically developed and owned? Uh, so it was, uh, so if we go back in the history first, so it started from a PhD uh, project from a student, which was Timothée Produit, uh, that further joined this uh, the university where am I working. And so the, the source code is owned by the university. And then the goal is to make it open source so that uh, so people from other institutions can contribute to the code and maybe improve further the, the project. But currently, it's, uh, it's a public project. We receive mainly public grant, and it's uh, manned and owned by the university. And he also goes on to ask, uh, uh, and how many people are there uh, in the team uh, full-time? How big is the project? Okay, so uh, we are five to ten people in the team, so it depends uh, when. And so, as I said, it's two institutes, so half the people are like software developer to develop the web application, and half the people are more uh, geo engineer uh, to develop the algorithm to geolocalize imaging, images or to extract the view shapes and footprints of images to integrate the elevation model from partners and so on. And so we don't work full time on it. So it's, a, it's part of a project among other projects in the Institute, but we, we, we have quite a lot of time to, to develop on it because there is always new features we would like to, uh, to develop. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I would like to also uh, next pick the question of, that is also from, uh, what was it? Yes. Or oh, Aya Pike. Uh, how are the geotags confirmed and edited? Ah, uh, so uh, that's something I didn't show, but there is a full back office for the partners. So where they can see the. Maybe I can quickly show you an example. That's perfect. So 
So here we can see all the current uh, georeferencing. So everything has to be validated by, uh, by someone. So once an image is geolocated, it comes to this back office, and then you, you have to, to validate the image. So you have a small interface that will allow you to check the image in three dimension, and then uh, decide if it's good enough or not. The same for the observations. You can see all the observation here, and then you can check. Yeah. And so that's the kind of observation I, I spoke about that we would like to link to, to Wikidata or external link data. So that's a castle uh, in Switzerland, I guess, but this one would be much helpful if it was a link to Wikidata. So you can check the, the the observation and you can check the position on the image and then you can validate or reject it. And the same for metadata and then a user we can also um, publish uh, an issue if there is something wrong like if an image cannot be geolocalized or something like this. So they can you can have uh, metadata creation and programs. Uh, then they can export everything. So they can export all the geolocation that we are done uh, they can export the geotags that, that were co computed. And currently it's done through Excel or CSV files. And that's also the goal of the API that it could be automatized a bit more. And so that they could like every night uh, retrieve everything that was done on Snapshot and integrate them in their own database, for instance, for libraries. Uh, you have also uh, management places where you can manage picture users and see some statistics. And this is the user part. If, you, if you're a volunteer, you can see all the dual referencing you did. And you can see, for instance, if there were improved. So this one was improved because one or many correspondence were maybe not so accurate. And then you can check the one that are pending, if it's still pending, or that were validated by the owner. And to validate, there will be this view. So you will, they will see the image. Uh, done as done by the user, and they can check if, uh, if the match is correct with the three D globes, and then they can improve if they want to put a new, a few more control points or validate the, the geolocation. So there is a back office for the owners to manage all of that. Yeah, Bahur is also asking if this is completely done in the back end by t the team members, or if there are ideas for for volunteers or some advanced volunteers to do the, the confirmation process? So currently the validation is not done by us, but it's done by the owner. So usually they have a small team that uh, we train to use the back office and they do themselves because they, they know better their images usually, they maybe know better the metadata or the format they expect for the metadata. Uh, so it's always done by the owner, it's not done by us. And currently there is no level of volunteers that would have access to, to both one. We didn't get the, the question from owners. Usually they, they agree to do it themselves, but could be an idea at some point. Hmm. Yeah, I had a, I had a very uh, tiny um, detailed question. Um, when you create the geolocation or like we geolocate the image, I presume you also get the the parameters for the image, such as the the confirmed uh, location of the photographer. Uh, as a yeah. result, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So that was and, the blue the blue point that was displayed on the map, yeah. And then maybe maybe a question uh, related to that is that. Um, you have decided to work on landscape images, and uh, is there a, a problem working with this in in cityscapes or other places, or like how do they play out these different uh, environments? Yeah, so uh, currently we do mainly uh, landscape images. So there are a few terrestrial images, but usually it's much more difficult to find the control points on the three D globes. So on the globes. Uh, we have mostly the terrain. We don't always have a building. And usually buildings, uh, the current buildings, the nowadays building, they are not on the picture. So it can be quite tricky to find correspondence between uh, the, the buildings that we could show in the 3D globes and the pictures. So that's why 
usually it's much more difficult to geolocalize images where you don't have like mountains in the back or streets. Mm -hmm. Usually people, they use like streets, uh, river, mountains, and maybe big buildings, but uh, only the, the footpaths of the building. But is it so that the technology itself is not uh, setting those limitations that you that that the material just is primarily uh, landscape imagery rather than cityscapes? Yeah, it's mostly because uh, it was so it's easier to geolocalize those images. So that's why we, at least the owner, usually they start with those images. Uh, but then we have a lot of landscape images from cities, but usually it's aerial images from cities. And the terrestrial images of the one that would be taken from the ground, uh, they would probably be hard to geolocalize, so that's why currently we don't uh, import them. Yeah, It's an interesting uh, problem to solve also, to use this kind of 3D um, yeah. localization for urban images. I'm wondering if I'm seeing more questions here. Let me let me see. I I think I have uh, have had a look at many of these, and and I'm encouraging you all of you, not you, Stefan, but the listeners, <laughs> uh, to uh, to uh, write in the pad. And also, you can contribute to the pad after the discussion and even discuss through the pad so that we can collaboratively process these ideas further and make note of, uh, of different links and also related, related uh, materials. And, and thank you for, for posting this on the, on the screen. But um, I think if there are no more, no more questions, please make a note or a sound or, or send a message if I'm missing something, I think we can take a break. Oh, there you are. Yes, yes, I, I added myself uh, quickly because uh, <laughs> I think uh, I think I, there was something I wanted to ask uh, more and, uh, and, and I thought it would be quicker to ask it directly. So, um, oh, uh, and now I, I, I forgot to get again, but I think in your uh, workflow, I mean, the geotagging workflow, it is always that you, you need to do the full, um, like, uh, go the full way. I mean, uh, uh, you, you can't just save the, like, the approximate location or uh, you need to do all, all the georeferencing with these reference points, etc. So is it, is, it, is it so, yes? Yeah, exactly. So currently we only accept people to submit geolocation when they do at least six points and they are happy enough with the uh, geolocation. But uh, you can still uh, uh, not finish it yet and you can go back a few hours later. Usually it's saved in cookies, if you accept the cookies, and so you don't have to start again uh, all the time. But then you could submit it for validation only when you it's fully geolocalized, yeah. Okay. And uh, I think, uh, yes, the other question I wanted to ask is, is about the community. So. Uh, yeah, you, you said that actually the validations are made by the uh, owners of the content, so the yeah. people who provide the content. Uh, but um, uh, so what about the snapshot community work? So who does that? I mean, how do you do? You, have you had uh, have you had held events for the uh, contributors, uh, or, and, and, uh, or and how does this information spread uh, about the platform and and so on? Uh, so, so I'm not sure I, I got the question. So how do we uh, communicate? Uh, what part you mean? I mean also, uh, have you have you held any specific uh, events for the uh, mm. for the contributors, or I mean to yeah. bring, bring people together and 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 also, is there a forum on the site, or how is there ways for the for the users to communicate uh, between themselves? So. Uh, so there is no way for, uh, so it's really single volunteers. So there is like a community because they, they participate to the same website, but that's, we didn't uh, implement a lot, but it's a community by itself. Uh, and most of the people, so they come from uh, the owner communities. So for instance, for the Technological University of Zurich, they already have a community that was uh, fixing the metadata from pictures. And then they launched with a snapshot, and so they could send an email to all 
their contributors that could register to Snapshot if they were interested and help to geolocalize the images. And uh, as we, we try from time to time to do events uh, with some partners, so we did with the Cantonal Archive here, uh, we did a webinar to present Snapshot also for people that were uh, following the Cantonal Archive so they can discover this new tool because there was a new collection that was published. So from time to time when there is a new collection, we try to do live webinar or event to, to present the tool, how people can help and they can also ask questions now and also ask an archivist uh, what they plan to do with the uh, results, maybe, and stuff like this. Okay. Thank you. So I will, I will uh, remove myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we can uh, take a break of uh, 15 minutes before the next, um, next event. Um, and uh, feel free to continue discussion on the pad uh, and try out this, these uh, projects while we are having a small coffee break. Yeah, you can go to the Smugshot website and try to geolocalize a few, a few images. Yes. There's still a few thousands to geolocalize. <laughs> we <are> all <laughs> so need don't it. hesitate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> OK, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susanna. Thanks See you soon. <laughs> Bye. Bye.
So, yeah, I, I think we have uh, like a minute to go, but uh, just to for a warm warm up chat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I, Can you I see. Me? <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, yes. Good. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> That's a good start, anyway. Yeah, very nice theatrical background, Peter. Yeah. So, <laughs> my Zoom room. Uh, is it okay if I just test the screen sharing? Uh, yes, yes. All right, just a second then. Okay. Yes. So, uh, so is my. Yes, I can see it. I, I, I read right. it uh, when it's when it's time. So, um, awesome. so, so yes, actually, so now from the Swiss Alps, we fly to the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, I'm I'm very honored to have uh, next two presentations uh, presented from US. Um, so it's it will be Vikram uh, and moderated by Peter. And yes, it's a full hour, so I will remove myself and give floor to you. So, so that. Good morning. Uh, and thanks, Vahur. Uh, and good morning, uh, Vikram. Nice to see you again. Um, yeah. uh, I'm Peter Krogh. I'm author of multiple books on digital asset management and chief product officer at Tandem Vault, a web based media management system for companies and institutions. I was very happy to meet Vahur when he brought me to Estonia last year. Well, I guess the year before now, there was that missing year in there uh, to run some workshops on scanning techniques uh, that use digital cameras. And I'm really happy to be included as the, the moderator for this session on Civil War Photo Sleuth. It's a successful crowdsourcing application for annotating images from the United States Civil War uh, and this is an area of great interest uh, to professional and, and amateur historians alike, um, certainly throughout the U.S., and I, I imagine uh, there's some, some interest abroad as well. And I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, our, our uh, speaker today, uh, Vikram Mahanti. He's a Ph.D. student at Virginia Tech and, and the lead developer on the application, um, and I had an interesting conversation with him yesterday about his work at the intersection of uh, AI-assisted human curation, and, and I'm interested in where, where that thread can pull today. Um, and uh, Vikram, let's, uh, let's have you take it away. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'll get started and share the screen. Uh, awesome. All right, uh, can you see my presentation, like slide decks? There we go, yes. Awesome, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about Sivor Fertitude. And before that, let me introduce myself. I am Vikram and I'm a computer science PhD student at Virginia Tech. And my area of research is human computer interaction. And I work at the Crowd Intelligence Lab where I'm advised by Dr. Kurt Luther. So, uh, as part of my research, I'm interested in building systems that can leverage the complementary strengths of artificial intelligence and collective human intelligence, and studying how people actually interact with these AI-infused systems to support like complex real-world problems like sense-making and image analysis tasks. And I explore these questions through by like through Civil War Firstly, it's a system, a free website that we built. Uh, so, uh, so this is the rough out outline of what I'm going to be talking about in the next half an hour or so. So I'm going to be giving some background of Civil photography and why this is an important problem. And then give a brief demo of different key features of Civil War Photo Sleuth and how it works. Uh, I'm going to be then talking about some of the some of our users and success stories and of the photos that have been uploaded to the site and some of the challenges that we've been facing. And then I'll be wrapping up with some of our next steps. Um, yeah, so if you look, I pulled up a bunch of unidentified photos from the website and it's pretty fascinating to see these photos like 
These photos have been taken like 150 years back. And these are individuals who went and fought the war. Their photos have survived. We don't know who they are. And that's exactly the guiding motivation behind this project. So, so the American Civil War was fought in for, from 1861 to 65. And it was an interesting time for photography. Like it had just become cheap and accessible for the soldiers as they were leaving for the war. So it was something for them to like share it with their loved ones to remember them. And the American Civil War was one of the first major conflicts that was widely photographed. And so back then you didn't have Instagram or something, but people had people could take their photos and it would be like a handful of them instead of like the hundreds that we take right now. And as you see in this quote, it says um, that these photos had sort of become the social currency of back then. By one estimate, there are over 4 million union portraits that survived today. And that's just one side of the war. And only 10 to 20% of them have been identified. So they're like historians, genealogists, archivists, collectors, dealers, who are all interested in identifying these unknown portraits. Uh, I'll give an example of what goes on into the process of identifying a soldier. So let's say if we are to identify this gentleman in the middle, I'll go through the process that someone would typically go through without first look. So the first step would be to extract some of the visual clues. So for example, like this person is wearing a dark coat, which means that he's from the Union Army. And then this, the frock coat that he's wearing is something that a brigadier general would wear. And the hat and the hat cord is also something that a general would wear. Now this sort of narrows down the whole pool, search pool into Union generals. So the next step would be to assemble like a collection, a representative collection of photos of Union generals. So these are like popular books and they're like roughly over 2000 photos of Union generals. And so you'd go through them manually and compare faces. And that's a manual and like completely tedious process. And there's no guarantee of finding a match, right? But in this case, this was a relatively easy match because this person has a unique nose and a and facial hair that can be compared. So you find a match of an identical soldier called, uh, named George Rutherford. Now the next step would be to like weigh other evidence. So the back mark of the photo says that it's taken in Washington, DC. And the tax stamp says that this photo might have come some, somewhere between 1864 and 66. So when you piece together all these piece, like puzzle pieces, then only you can make like an airtight identification. Okay, this gentleman is George Rutherford. Now these identifications actually are where happening on social media, like there are multiple Facebook groups and pages where people actually post photos and then ask others, like basically talking, basically leveraging the wisdom of crowds here. So this example, you can see that someone posted this photo and then someone else answered, okay, like I know who this is and give their evidence. Uh, but as you can see, like there's a lot, there are a lot of challenges in this. This whole process is manual, it's tedious. It can be fatiguing if one person has to go through like 2000 photos it's slow. And if it's on Facebook, it's again, disorganized conversations might diverge, there might be repetition. So we, we wanted to tackle this problem and, and build Civil War Photo Sleuth just to solve this. So Civil War Photo Sleuth is actually an academic project, which is part of my PhD. And it's a free website where people can actually go and sign up and add photos and identify using the tools that we provide. So we released this back in August, 2018. Uh, and yeah, the website is built on top of a novel person identification pipeline that combines facial recognition technology and crowdsourcing. So I'll explain that here. So, so this process is like human led and supported by AI. So 
what happens is like the user would upload a photo of the unknown soldier and then they would tag the different visual clues. In this case, the hat, the uniform, the insignia, backdrop and the weapon. And the system would then generate search field like Civil War domain knowledge. For example, like like I mentioned, the coat color would translate into which army the person served, the shoulder straps or the chevrons would translate into which branch or what ranks it is. Uh, so once you have these search filters, you basically narrow down the search pool. So you only need to look for those soldiers who match these search records. Then we use facial recognition. So for face recognition, we use Microsoft's Azure Face API, which then would search for the facially similar looking people in that sort of narrow down search pool. So this person identification process is pretty analogous to finding a needle in a haystack. And essentially this process is about, you know, when you upload a photo, you're actually building the haystack. And then with these search filters and face recognition, you're sort of narrowing down the haystack. And now the search results will return the most similar looking soldiers with matching records. So in this case, like I think it's mostly private, union privates. So once you get this search results, the user would then go through each of the search results individually, like look at the evidence, which is like, are these photos facially similar or not? And then look at the biographical records or the service records and see whether they line up. So it's a two-step process where, in, where to identify. So once the photo is identified, the website creates like a soldier profile for the photo. So uh, let me see if I can check, open this. Um, uh, uh, is my screen visible? All right. Yes. All right, cool. So this is what a photo page looks like for, let's say, photo 39259. So it's this photo has been identified as George Varney. And we the system actually generates like a badge, whether it, this photo has been, this identification has been verified or if it needs verification. Then you have the metadata over here. Right? What's the photo format? What, where's the, where is it coming from? Who's the owner? Who has added it? If the photo has an inscription or photograph or info. And then you have the uniform clues when they have tagged for the face. And then you have the identity over here. So in, under this identity, you'll have this biography section that talks about what the demographic information is, the ranks held, the units served, where is this coming from? Users can actually click this unit to see other soldiers in that unit. In addition to that, you have something like a community stewardship stuff where people have actually weighed in on this identification and whether this is correct or not. So for this identification, like 13 users have given their opinions. So you can click on view details and see what they're saying. So in this case, this user actually mentions a different URL that maybe is the proof. This user is mentioning, okay, why he thinks, yes, highly confident. So, uh, so that's the visualization for like valid, validating this identification. And then we have a pro some provenance information, like identification sources. What What's the proof that this photo is um, George Varney? So in this case, there are like some secondary sources, which are scholarly sources. For example, the US Army Heritage and Education Center, which is like a pretty reliable source. There's a facial match to a photo that comes from there. And we also show that it's supported by face recognition. Um, we also show that this photo itself came with a source that comes from the main state. This is probably a website from the main state archives. In addition to that, we also have like an activity feed maintained for each photo that talks about all the users who have contributed to the page. So you can think of it as some sort of accountability and as a log to check who all have contributed to this page. Uh, 
yeah, coming back to, so that's what the photo page would look like for uh, each photo. Uh, so there's another, uh, this is what the page looks like when you have to tag the uniform clues. So you can tag something like coat color, chevrons, shoulder straps, collar insignia, hat insignia, and others. So, and you can also do it after a photo has been identified or something. So you can go to the photo page and tag them. At Photo Sleuth, we sort of follow like an open participation model like Wikipedia. So anyone can, any user can come and add information. So this is what the uh, uniform tagging page looks like. Uh, similarly, like they can tag the metadata, whether this photo has an inscription, whether the photo has like the photographer information, like the name and location, because these are all like useful clues that can be, that can help in identifying this person. So uh, similar to the previous one, this is also, anyone can come and add this. Uh, one key functionality of the website is we allow anyone to come and search for photos. Like if you have a name or if you know if you have some unit information, then you can go and search for them. So in this case, like um, I'm playing this video, so um, you can go and check off like the whether the unit or the branch or the rank of the soldier. So in this case, like I was checking someone from Union, Massachusetts, 54th Infantry. So yeah, and this can be, and this will retrieve all the soldiers that have been identified and have the same service records. Yeah, and so yeah, there are like 60 photos that have been, uh, that are from the 54th Massachusetts Infantry. And you can, through this page, you can access the photo page of those soldiers. So yeah, so this is like a name or unit based search. And to access this feature, you don't need to be a registered user. So anyone can come use this website for searching a photo if you have a name or if you're looking for a particular unit. Vikram, can you uh, um, tell me what information is displayed about each person in that? Um, yeah, in the in search results page. Yeah, in the search results page. Yeah. Uh, so for each photo, we show the ranks held, the name, and a thumbnail of the photo and the units they served in. And for units, it's basically the site, the regiment number, uh, the state the branch, and if there's a company. So uh, is this also showing a confidence level? No, that... so this is, yeah, so this is not the face recognition search. This is just like, a, you know the name or you're looking for a particular unit. Okay, I, so, I can, uh, it's a little small on my screen here, but um, uh, d does it, it doesn't have the, uh, the that uh, colored bar underneath the name, is that, that's the verification level, not not confidence like AI confidence. Yeah, so that's like a verification level, whether this photo has been verified by the community and or whether it needs verification or if it needs some tags. So those badges are just to indicate that. That So that badge is, is really important sort of front and center in your search results to, uh, to show what, uh, uh, whether this is highly confident or or needs more annotation. Right, right, yeah. So that's that's something that we, like I showed in the previous uh, demo about the photo page, where each for each identification has like a badge, whether it needs verification, whether it's verified. So this is basically the same thing. All right. Uh, okay. I'll go to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So this is. So we have a feature where we allow the community to come and validate an identity, like whether the community can come and weigh in on whether this identification is correct or incorrect. So 
in this case, uh, so let's say like, this is Thomas Bigney. Uh, someone has identified this. So John Hill, this user has uploaded this photo and he also identified this as Thomas Bigney. And me as a user is coming to this page. And so now I can weigh in whether this is correct or not. And I'm looking at the sources. It seems like it's coming from a museum website, which seems pretty official. And it's also coming from, well, I think I'm pretty confident that this might be the same person. And in this case, like in the two-step process, first I compare both the photos. And I can see like the signature is wrong. And there's a facial match or a replica. A replica is basically an identical copy, which is uh, which is something that we can see here. These photos are basically an identical copy of each other. So I identify them. So I answer that it's a replica. And in the second step, it's asking me, okay, now you've weighed all the evidence. Do you think that this photo is Thomas Bigney? And and can give confidence level and add a note about why I think so. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so I basically gave the reason that it's a replica of a photo from a known collection. It's also been identified by a museum and it also has an inscription. So it seems fairly reliable. And now you can see my vote being reflected in the visualization over here. So previously it was like there was one vote, now it's two votes. And my comment also appears there for other users who might come over there. So, so, uh, so right now this photo, uh, yeah, this photo says it needs verification. So in order for this photo to be verified, it needs votes from at least six different users. Uh, all right, I'll go to the next one. Yeah, so this is like a demo. Uh, so this is where I'll show the face recognition element. So this is uh, this is a video of me adding a photo and identifying it. So on the home system, and so you, you add a photo and you mention where, where you're getting this photo from. So in this case, I have a test photo. And you can add the front view and the back view of a photo. So for some cases, like a back view is important because sometimes you'll have the photograph or name or the inscription on the back, which might be very useful to identify photo. So, but in this case, I didn't have a back view. Um, so when you upload, we use the same face recognition algorithm to detect a face in the photo. So sometimes blurry photos or like occluded photos the algorithm cannot detect a face. And unfortunately, we cannot do anything about it at this point. But yeah, it's important that the algorithm detects a face in the photo. So, so once you upload the photo, the next step is to tag the metadata. And we have a feature like ask the users to like specify who the owner of the photo is in case someone else goes and someone else needs to contact them for this photo. Uh, sorry, I think I may accidentally click. Yeah, and yes, photo have an inscription or a photographer name. So I click tag. Now you have to tag the uniform evidence. So th clearly this person is wearing a dark coat color and there's shoulder strap, one star, and I think there's something written in the ad insignia, but I couldn't read it, so I didn't tag anything. So once you have the dark coat color and tag, then it asks you whether you know the name of this person. And if you know, if you know who this person is, then you also have to provide your source for it. You can't just go and say that I know it because um, so now with this dark coat color and shoulder strap of one star, it generates the search filters, which is union and a brigadier general. So when I search, face recognition is gonna go and search 
for all similar looking generals from Union Army. So in this case, you can see like these are, so, and these search results are sorted by similarity with face recognition. We do not show the face recognition confidence scores because they'll sort of bias the user to like, uh, so if we don't want them to buy, be biased instead, we want them to check everything. So, but it's sorted according to similarity. Now, ideally a user would go and check individually for, uh, so in this case, maybe like I'll look for this photo. I don't think they're the same person. So I can be confident and say like, no, I don't think they're the same person. Uh, in this case, the first one looks very promising. So I can basically compare it. They basically look like the same guy. So I think you can say, yes, facial match. And the second, there's another photo. So I think I'll go with facial match. And the service records line up with the uniform information. So maybe I I'm pretty confident because there's facial match and all everything else lines up. So I can give my reason for it. And now this photo has been identified, so I can go to the photo page. And this looks like this. And it says it needs verification because it doesn't have enough votes, it's just me saying it. And you can see the scholarly sources and the secondary sources over here. Um, we're uh, getting a little bit of glitchiness uh, in your feed. I don't know if there's uh, anything running on your computer that you can shut off or possibly the background, but who knows what's really behind you. If it's a virtual background, that, that might be something that's eating up processor. Okay. Is it better now, like by any chance? That seems uh, better. Let's give it a try like that. All right, cool. So. Yeah, so this is basic. This was basically the whole process of, you know, adding a photo and then identifying it. So the next step was for us to build a critical mass of users. So, in order to do that, we actually before the release of the website, we sort of like advertised this cool new website coming up on social media and the groups where this kind of photo identification is already happening, and then we held like in-person events at Civil War collectible shows like in Gettysburg and the National Archives in Washington, DC. And then we got our press coverage. So this helped us like getting the word out and building like an initial critical mass of users. So every user actually gets a user profile page where they can add the biography, their age and demographics and all their photos that they have uploaded would appear over there as like, their collection. They can also add their interests, which is sort of like they can go and search it. And they also have like a activity feed of all the different activities they have done on the website. And that looks like this. Um, so yeah, who, are our users and how many users we have. So in the past two and a half years, we have sort of something over 17,000 registered users. Uh, while most of the users uh, are like maybe one-time users, we have some active users who would be basically like photo collectors. And uh, we also have like unregistered users who basically use the website to just browse photos or search for them. But in order to like contribute to the website, you need to be a registered user. Uh, so on the right, I have like, we have like one to five. Um, so people who are the most number of people are like the ones who have uploaded on only like one to five photos. A very few of them have uploaded over 400 photos. Uh, the vast majority actually just use the site for like browsing 
the photos. Uh, but we do have a significant number of users who have uploaded like over 50 photos to the website. Uh, in terms of the age distribution, the majority of our users who have provided their age are actually over the age of 50, which is sort of fascinating because that's not what you would see in an online community, which is usually formed by a younger demographic. Uh, so people like the users are from different backgrounds, like family history researchers, genealogists, collectors, dealers, park rangers, historians, teachers, and actually descendants who are using the site to identify uh, the photos that are in their family collection. Uh, so uh, in terms of photos that have been added to the website, there are over 37,000 photos that are on the so we have photos on the website. So to say that we are one of the largest digital collections of Civil War portraits. So in order to avoid the cold start problem, we actually see the website with over 20,000 photos from numerous, numerous public collections. And this also included like targeted efforts to add photos of women and African-American soldiers. I mean, while they're pretty rare. Our website is pretty disproportionate in terms of diversity. Uh, vast majority of the photos are mostly Union white soldiers. Uh, further, like over 16,000 photos have been added by users. And these user added photos come from diverse sources. Like if there's a collector, then it comes from personal collection. Uh, family photos, social media, libraries, museums, archives, genealogy websites like Fold3, uh, Ancestry, Find a Grave, etc. So these are like two of our top most active users who have added like close to 2,000 photos and 700 photos. So we actually conducted a study like way back in the first month of the launch. And one of our participants we asked them why, what's the motivation behind adding them? and he mentioned that I'm just trying to help other people out, like I want me to be helped out. So there's an altruistic component and reciprocity, I would say. Um, so around like 7,000 user added photos have been are unidentified and 6,000 user added photos are identified. The rest actually do not have a face detected, so they cannot be identified. Uh, but yeah, like, it's pretty like the number of unidentified photos on the website are pretty huge. Uh, among the ones that are identified, they can be separated into pre-identified and post-identified. By pre-identified, I mean like users actually knew who these people are way before before uploading the photo to the site, and some of them they didn't know, and the website helped them identify. And usually, like these identifications are supported by corroborating evidence, like whether it's a facial match replica or like it's a source or there's an inscription. So there's some excitement with among users like when they use this site and get a hit. So like someone said, I found maybe 10 to 15% hits on images that had squirreled away that first it was able to compare to and bring up either the exact same image or an alternative that was clearly the same person. Uh, so some of the success stories like there, uh, there have been numerous photos that have been identified from public collections. So for example, like this photo on the left, it was in the Library of Congress and it was unidentified. But with the help of Photo Sleuth, we found a match to a photo from the Main State Archives, which had a signature, or an inscription, and everything else checked out. And this photo was identified as Francis M. Everett, an assistant surgeon. And they have, they on the Library of Congress website they have attributed to a photo Uh This is an interesting story. This is one story from someone's private collection. So Dave Morin is a collector of New Hampshire images. He was drawn to this portrait of an unidentified Union second lieutenant, mainly because of its Manchester New Hampshire backmark. So when Furtislut suggested a potential match with William Baldwin of first New York engineers. He couldn't explain why a New York officer, officer was photographed in New Hampshire, despite the strong facial similarities. 
So he did his follow-up research and confirmed that Baldwin was in fact a native of New Hampshire. He said that I never would have found Baldwin without this, never. Uh, this is a in per particularly interesting story. Uh, so, so this photo on the left, it comes from a public collection and it was identified as David T. Brown. And this is one of those photos that we had scraped in the original seeded photos. Now there's another user who came and uploaded this photo on the right from the main state archives, which has a period inscription. And he uploaded this photo and he thought like both these photos are a match. They can either be James M. Brown or David T. Brown. One was from Maine, the other one was from Massachusetts. And they're both from different collections. So either they are twins or, so there's something going on there. And so he basically identified the left one. He added the identity over there. The community went and weighed in and one of the community members actually discovered that in the regimental history of Massachusetts, that David T. Brown is actually a different guy, a completely different guy. And so everyone voted, and this photo from a public collection was actually corrected as James M. Brown. So this is one area where photo sleuth has been helpful, like you can resolve conflicts with the community. Uh, let's talk about some of the challenges. So, so in photo sleuth, we could study like in the first month, and we found like 12 photos were misidentified out of like 119 photos. And one of the reasons could be like the face recognition is far from perfect. For example, like this guy on the left, the search result appears like on the fifth match or something. So um, if a user actually doesn't understand how this works or they, if they think like, okay, like the top match must be the correct one. So there's a possibility of like making, misidentifying a photo. Sometimes there might not be a match and users might have some kind of confirmation bias and they can match it. Uh, there might be other financial incentives like a uh, an identified photo is much more valuable than an unidentified one. And so you might wonder like, okay, so what happens if a photo is misidentified? But yeah, because someone might write an article on it or with the, wrong identification or someone might sell it with the wrong identification and there's money involved. So so this is one of the challenges on the website and because it's an online community, it's pretty analogous to misinformation spreading on social media. We actually took some steps to tackle it. For example, like previously, like the comparison interface like would look something like this. You basically compare, for, looked at the photo and then you just identify it. So that's as simple as it gets, like for identifying a photo. So we recently made modification to this interface, like where we made it a bit more structured, deliberative, and asked users to weigh the evidence and then make a decision. Further, we are trying to tackle this by making users provide provenance information and then creating this interface showing, okay, there's a facial match, there's, it's supported by facial recognition. This is a scholarly source. So by making this, we are sort of forcing users to make the right identification. In addition to that, people browsing the a photo page might be able to assess better whether a photo has been correctly identified or not. Uh, we are also trying to tackle it with community stewardship where we allow people to come and vote on this, which we didn't have before, but we released this feature in December 2020. And then we have these badges that say, like, okay, this photo need, this ID needs verification. This has been verified. Uh, this is based on like, okay, there needs to be a reliable source and there needs to be a community consensus on this. Now, this is sort of a challenge because even though there's tool support for this, but the community needs to be more engaged. It's not common for, it's not common to see photos having this many votes. It's usually like one, two votes. So that's one challenge that we are tackling. Uh, something that we would like to see is like more community engagement, the kind, the likes of which we see on Facebook groups. 
So you can see these examples where people are posting, others are coming and weighing in. So we'd like to see some more traction uh, similar to this. Uh, this is an interesting point, like this privacy. So because there's some financial incentives in around uh, like a, a photo being identified, one of the quotes that we got from our study was, if I can find a match, it's good for me. But then it also may give somebody else that match and then it becomes a bidding war whether I'm gonna pay more, uh, pay more for it on eBay than that person is. So sometimes people don't like to make the information public. Like if this, if they know the identity of a photo, they don't want to make it public because it might raise a bidding war. Uh, so we don't have any support for like privacy on the website for over the content yet. So that's one challenge that we're looking at. Uh, the like I mentioned earlier, like the vast majority of the photos, user edited photos are still unidentified and some of them might remain unidentified, but I think we would want more community engagement and effort to like make them identify. Uh, similarly, that we seeded the website with, they are missing these tags because like it needs human effort to go through this and tag them. One idea here would be to build some kind of computer vision model to automatically tag them. So that's one of the challenges. Uh, some of the next steps that we're looking at are these crowdsourcing tasks that we have on our dashboard, where you know, like people can go and verify 50 identities. We have some community goals. Uh, similarly, for tagging, for us, so but we need to like explore this in more sort of like a leaderboard kind of thing that you see in common crowdsourcing websites. So that's one of our future works. Uh, so this is a spin-off website that we are gonna be releasing soon where users can find their lookalike from the American Civil War era. And this is an effort in collaboration with the American Battlefield Trust to raise awareness about the Civil War, about Civil War history. So we built this website web application to where we users are gonna learn about the Civil War and facial recognition and its strengths and limitations. So that's one of our future works. I gotta say um, that is that is a cool idea. <laughs> Thank you. I really uh, like that. Uh, I'll yeah. keep going. Sure. Uh, and so these are some of the awards that the project has received. So one of them is the Microsoft Cloud AI Research Challenge for like good users of Microsoft products, which is a facial recognition part. And since this is like an academic research project and we publish in CI human computer interaction conferences, this is one best paper and best demo awards. Uh, thanks to NSF and Virginia Tech, uh, ICTES for funding this project and our collaborators and Dr. Carl Luther, uh, whose brainchild this project is and different students who have worked on this project with me over the years. Um, finally, like you can reach me and if you have any questions. Uh, Vikram, that was that was fabulous. And um, I think I think both the uh, project itself is fabulous as well as the um, your very thorough uh, discussion of the uh, many deep issues that you've been yeah. um, addressing with this. And sure. uh, so many of the questions that I had uh, were actually answered in your presentation, which means you made your presentation really well, uh, really good. Um, uh, did, you didn't address the issue here of, uh, that we discussed yesterday about matches that were too close and how that discourages, can discourage the gamification um, that, uh, or did, did you, did I, did I miss that flying by? Um, let me, let me go to the slides with the search results. Um, for example, like the matches over here that might be too close, right? Yeah, you were, you were saying, um, you were talking about uh, encouraging user participation, which obviously is a huge successful part of this project. And you were mm -hmm. saying that when you uh, set your AI and it, it, the, the, uh, 
facial recognition was was too good. People weren't the the participation uh, yeah. was dropping off. Um, yeah. You talk how you how you think about user participation and and the fact that they need to do something. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, glad you brought it up. Uh, so yeah, like I mentioned, the whole these the identification process is pretty uh, human led AI supported. So uh, one of the fun parts of it is like these people who are using this website actually like to go through different photos. I mean, it's fun for them to like see who Charles A. Drake was or William Driver was. So they would like to, part of the fun user experience is to like go through these individually. So, so the face recognition model that we use for in terms of like the technology terms, it's false positives, right? Like. So only one of them can be the answer or none of them can be. So let's say a face recognition model returns 100 results. So people have a lot more to go through. That's part of the fun. Now, let's say Microsoft comes up with a new face recognition model, which has, quote unquote, like fewer false positives according to their metrics. Now that would mean instead of 100 results, we would see like five results. And now that, to explore and that might discourage them from even using this site. So uh, by giving them more choices to explore, I think uh, we believe this uh, is sort of like a successful participation model. Yeah, so the uh, um, what it's a little counterintuitive what seems like it ought to be a better way to get people to um, uh, to be able to create accurate matches actually right. discourages the use. Right. Uh, there has been a similar project in Zooniverse where someone, where they built like a machine learning model to identify some animals in the bushes or something like that. Mm -hmm. some, some, something related to that. So when they released this new model, which sort of detected it automatically and the users didn't have to do a lot of work, it like they saw the participation dropping down. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's evidence of it as well. So uh, another another thing, sort of in that same uh, human interaction gamification, and um, you you settled on six matches to say that this is uh, this is a match. Six verifications to say it's a match, or six right. users to. Um, can you talk about did you just guess at that and stick with it, or did you adjust that number? So uh, we actually did some preliminary start. Like we had a, a prototype called Second Opinion, where we had like experts collaborating with novice crowd workers. Mm -hmm. So crowd workers would come from like Amazon Mechanical Turk. So we uh, so we actually started with three. Mm -hmm. And the expert said like three was too small a number. I mean, it can like one vote changes 33%. Yeah. So maybe double it. And we went with six and we actually saw promising results there uh, where like these crowd workers could actually, like six crowd workers, if we aggregate them, it could they could filter out the false positives. So we started with that number and now we took that idea to this project, like into photo sleuth, and we went with like, okay, you need six highly confident people to say, okay, like this is a match. And it's not just six itself, right? It, it also combines with the sources that are out there, like whether the source is reliable or not. So, so far, like the preliminary studies that I've conducted, uh, people are satisfied with six as a number, but it was pretty, um, yeah, empirical, I would say. Um, do you have a, a notion of how many photos are misidentified in the system? Again, I might have seen that go by, but uh, I, I don't remember it. <laughs> okay. so, uh, so we only, so we did some kind of a study in the first month yeah. of the website. Yeah. So, so in the first month, uh, so in the first month, there were 560 photos that were identified by users, of which 441, they knew the IDs beforehand. Mm -hmm. 
So of the 119 photos that were identified on the website using this face recognition and all, we found 12 photos that were manufactured. So that was the first month. So, and, but now things have changed. Over 6,000 photos are identified. Uh, we don't have a good idea of like, because it, it'll require us to go through them manually and because the other one required us doing like manual content analysis. But the goal right now is that we sort of allow these photos to be discovered by the community more so the community themselves can correct it. Like if, if they find the photo to be misidentified, they can go and correct it. Are you seeing a lot of corrections or or um, uh, people that are suggesting a correction? Uh, we are not, unfortunately. Uh, it sort of has, uh, like I mentioned, like this is one of the challenges that we are facing, which is that which is that even though we have the tool support for it, like it still requires like targeted efforts, right? Like. Right. For example, we have to hold like community events, like a virtual Zoom session, like, and then we pick, okay, like here are some photos that we are focusing on. So now they get the attention of users and they would come and vote on it. But otherwise we, that's one of the challenges that we're tackling. Like how do we get the community more engaged? Like Facebook, for example. Yeah. Yeah, that, that will will have some impact on the number of right. people coming in. Um, right. uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting, that would be an interesting thread to pull, um, yeah. set up and try and figure out what your accuracy level is and um, uh, right. whether you need to fine tune the algorithm. Um, right. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Oh, sorry, to, go ahead. To, yeah, to follow up on that. So so we do have like mechanisms to detect. So this verified ID badge, that's pretty reliable. Like if photo has a verified ID, then that, that means that there's some reliable source out there. Like we don't verify a photo without any reliable evidence. So that's there. So it's the photos that need verification, but uh do not have enough votes. And I we speculate that it's mostly because these photos are not being discovered by the community. So with our studies that we have conducted recently has mostly, people have, people have appreciated the process they do to go through the validated, validated identity. Like they like the process, they like what they're seeing. I think it's, it's a matter of like getting more people into it. Um. There's a, a question um, here from James uh, about uh, people's reluctance to share images. <laughs> I think we could do an entire another webinar on on motivation <laughs> and, and learning right. it. Uh, but uh, do you have a quick thought on on how this is right. encouraging people to share images? So people actually, um, uh, from what we've understood, like because. The more you share, the, the more photos that you share on the website, better the algorithm gets at. I mean, the search results, uh, they're gonna be richer. So they sort of understand that part and they believe that, okay, like their photos, if they upload it, someone else can come and identify it. And we have received emails of people thanking us because someone else has identified them and their photos. And so that's one motivation for them on the other end, the privacy part that I mentioned where people are sometimes reluctant to like, they'll add a photo, they'll see who that identity is and then they'll go and delete it so that others don't see it. So that's also a flip, like two sides of the coin, I would say. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing that um, you, you sort of mentioned very quickly and we discussed it a little more yesterday about how right. the, the identification of the person in the photo Right. actually has a significant monetary value and right. yeah and uh, you were talking about uh, you know everything from people uh, misidentifying in order to enhance value or to identify something that's unidentified that might be at auction um, right yeah so because there is some financial incentive tied to 
uh, an identity. Uh, basically, an identified photo is much more valuable than an unidentified photo, and uh, so that would like I mean the price would go up like two times or three times, and thousands of dollars. Yeah, essentially, and yeah, and so and it's uh, and it's very easy to identify on the website. At least it used to be. So uh, you would just see a search result and then they, you could match it. And nobody else could come and say that, okay, this is wrong. So all these features, these features to tackle misidentification have been, have come up recently, like basically this December, like last December. So up until then, like there was no correction mechanism uh, and Identifying with face recognition was pretty easy, and people basically cite photos by saying that, okay, like photo sleuth's face recognition says that they're a match, and that's why I'm going with, let's say, Charles Drake here for this right. photo. So uh, that's one aspect that we, and and in, in a way, we would be responsible if there's fake information out there. So that's why we added all this correction mechanism so the community itself can be in the game. Yeah, it's that's a it's fascinating. I you know, as when you mentioned privacy originally, I thought, well, what could what privacy issues could there be for a hundred and you know fifty year old photograph <laughs> somebody who's long dead, and then it turns out, well, it's yeah. the property owners. It's you know, it's right. the object, the op, the privacy yeah. the object publicly or or not. Uh, fascinating stuff. Yeah. Um, I you know, I could I could go another hour on this, but I think we're out of time. Um, Bahur, did you have anything you wanted to uh, to ask here? Yeah, well, I have several things, but indeed we, we are running out of time. But I, I really, I, I'm really in awe uh, of the presentation, and and I think that uh, probably we can continue the discussion in in uh, in private or. Uh, but but really, uh, but maybe just a quick question. So that sure. as your the uh, the face recognition you are using the model, is it something mm -hmm. that you? That you are training and developing yourself, or uh, and is it is it learning from the results from the crowdsourced uh, validations, or uh, or not? Uh, yeah, interesting question. So we actually use Microsoft's Azure Face API, and uh, like we don't train it, but we actually did an initial like preliminary study of how crowdsourced responses, if they are put back into the loop then they can actually filter out some of these false positives. But we actually do not train any model yet. OK. OK. And I mean, uh, also obvious, obvious. I think, uh, question is about like uh, extending or using this platform for other types of, uh, of images, uh, like uh, people, uh, people, pictures depicting people. I mean, not, not only the civil war, but also uh, more, more recent ones and then from, from public collections. I mean, the need to identify uh, people is, is there for, for every uh, photographic collection. Right. Uh, so, so because, uh, yeah, I mean, this goes back to what Peter was mentioning, like what 150, what privacy concerns could be there with 150 year old photos but if it's modern photos there is a privacy concern and um so there i mean that's why we sort of reluctant to use it on like like modern photos just because there's some eth there would be a bunch of ethical concerns to use it but um so in the recent like the january 6th ca riots in the capitol hill over here uh so these photos are actually being so the, rioters they're getting identified on social media like yeah. on twitter and and the misidentifications over there have much higher bigger consequence than the civil war photos getting misidentified because someone's life is going to get destroyed by that yeah so uh so there's like a bunch of these aspects that we would have to look at in order for this project to be extended for that purpose so that's also primarily the reason why we have not open sourced this project is because there's this face recognition component which which the, the algorithm is far from being perfect it doesn't work as well for like women or people of color so uh the risks are much higher and uh, so we want we would want to avoid it being misused so yeah okay 
as as much as it would be great to continue, I think we, yes. <laughs> we need a minute between presentations. So, uh, Vikram, thank you so much, and I, I can't wait to see where this project goes. Sure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. See you, everybody. So, okay, it's it's already one minute past, but um, our next presenter uh, is a bit late, so uh, we're still waiting for him to join the session, but uh, but just uh, just um, just a moment, yes. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe <clears throat> for those who uh, who have joined the feed. Um, um, later. Uh, so I, I also uh, just want to say that I, I'm uh, here in the um, uh, Museum of Photography in, in Tallinn. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a branch of the Tallinn City Museum. And, uh, and this webinar is, uh, is part of the celebration of, of the 10th ten, anniversary of the IA bike um, crowdsourcing platform. That uh, that I am the manager of, and to celebrate that, uh, we even made a, a small home brew. Uh, so uh, it was uh, brewed in on the nineteenth of November last year, um, and and um, and uh, so it has stayed. So it's a uh, it's uh, <coughs> so it, the uh, title says that it's. Uh, a bike established in uh, 2011, brewing date, uh, the brew, brewmaster, and so it's an APA and 5%. So, uh, uh, of course, it's it's difficult to to come together these days. So I, I brought some bottles along as a present to the people here at the, at the photo museum. So... Uh, uh, James, may I add you as well uh, in the stream until we, uh, yeah, let me add you. So is it okay for you to, say, to join? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, Sandra is also asking about the, uh, 
uh, the label. Yeah, the label is professional. So uh, it's a it's a homebrew. <laughs> it's a, a but uh, the label is really um, is really uh, from the label factory. I don't know so. about hackathons. They should have brewathons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that'd be good. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, I also it was first time for me to to see the brewing process so uh, it's uh, it's uh, the brewery is in a, in a cellar of a, a student um, how you call it um, this kind of student organization uh, uh, so uh, so yes I wonder I wonder where is uh, John I've sent a couple of emails to John but no reply. I don't have any direct way of contacting him. I don't believe. But um, I wonder, just uh, until uh, John joins us, uh, but Vikram, he's still here. So maybe we can ask more questions from Vikram, if it's okay with you, Vikram. Uh, uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I had, I had it. So, uh, unfortunately, I have turned off my, uh, closed my slides, like, but I can answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, I think there's no need for slides, probably, but uh, but uh, you can just. Uh, um, I mean, there was so many interesting interesting points you you uh, brought out in your. Oh, there was one thing I, I noticed very briefly on a slide. There was something about a quality grade when you sh uh, showed the log. The activity log of a specific picture uh, yeah. was something. Uh, so, is the quality grade is this four step? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So we have uh, we have a four step process to get verified, which is uh, uh, for it needs to have uh, some of these tags, the metadata and the uniform clues. So it needs to be tagged. Then it needs to have an ID. And then it needs to be verified by the community web. And the verification happens through like the community of sports and reliable sources being present. And when I say reliable sources, it's basically primary sources and like period inscriptions are like scholarly sources, like coming from a book or from a library or a museum. So yeah, so that's the four step process. Okay. And uh, and machine vision, you are using. I mean, you are only using uh, face recognition, but I mean this insignia and that stuff. Uh, you don't uh, use uh, machine vision for for this. Uh. Yeah, that's a uh, good question. We don't use yet, but that's in the stores. Like that's something that we are planning on doing because we have collected enough data now, so we can basically train. Uh, Computer vision models and can be basically used to identify uh, like these clues. Uh, I think John. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you once more, Vikram, for 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 your presentation and uh, and I welcome uh, John uh, who has joined us now as the next presenter. <clears throat> so uh, I give floor to to you, James and and John and. Okay. Uh, hey, I'm so sorry. I guess I had the wrong time zone. I'm just fresh off the meditation mat, so hopefully I have a clear mind to present. <laughs> you look relaxed, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so relaxed. <laughs> um, right. Well, welcome, John. Welcome, anybody else who's joined us for this uh, fourth session. Um, I've been asked uh, very kindly by Vahor to, to, to moderate this. Um, I think, John, did you want to do it more as a kind of, you haven't got a presentation, is that right? We're just going to do sort of live demo. We're going to do some live demo. We're going to do Bring some storytelling. We're going to okay. see if anyone has any questions. Yeah. yeah that would be great. Um, so I'll keep an eye on the questions. Um, I've also got lots of my own already. So we'll, <laughs> I'm sure we never have a problem talking about stuff like this. So yeah. that's fine. Um, just for anybody who doesn't know me, um, James Morley, I've got a background working on museums, collections, and particularly websites and, and data. Um, I also did a two-year stint at Europeana 
um, managing the developer outreach community. Um, and then uh, recently I've actually moved completely away from the sector professionally. Um, I now run a guest house, <laughs> which is where I'm sitting at the moment, except I don't run a guest, out, guest house because of COVID, um, which has given mm. me a little bit more time to carry on doing a bit more consultancy. John's off again. Um, and um, most recently I have, uh, well, a couple of years ago, I built a site called A Street Near You, um, which was just a completely personal project, but but rather took off and, and sort of cemented my kind of uh, passion and enthusiasm for everything to do with uh, geolocated open data and so on. Um, that was to do with First World War casualties. Um, and it's still a project that I maintain. I've been doing some work on it this morning um, and getting something yeah. around. I think we're, it now runs at about 10,000 visits a week. Um, wow. And, and that was with, uh, I think I've, I've currently had some total in the last two and a half years of um, 700 pounds, so about $1,000 of, of funding. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so, but as I always say, it's always down to the power of the data and and, the, and it was all data that I was able to tap into that, that made it a success. But um, History Pins project I've had, a, I've been long been a fan of, as John, as John well knows. I was checking out earlier um my own in fact, i can just have i won't share my screen but i'll just have another quick read look so i can read it out um so my my earliest pin on history pin was august 2010. oh um, i've added 270 pins apparently which doesn't feel that many to me i ought to be a bit more active um and created 15 collections and one tour and my profile i don't know if this is profile or pictures have had twenty thousand and 710 views so i'll ask john a few questions in a in a in a while about impact and and so on as as well but actually what got me into history pin was i i'm also a collector of uh early photography so i was particularly fascinated by all of the earlier presentations um the and that's the whole topic of this afternoon's sort of seminar um and then then also obviously a big technophile so the notion that I could stick my photographs on a map, overlay them on Google Street View and so on was was really exciting 11 years ago and, and obviously still is today. Um, so uh, as I say, um, big fan of History Pin, um, long time user and, and known John for a while. We don't have these sorts of chats anything near as often as we ought to <laughs> then again we might not get any work done if we <laughs> if we just talked but this is a great opportunity um so i will hand over to john um i mean if you could just start with a, a brief introduction about yourself and history pin obviously the shift organization that it falls within now um and just yeah just give a brief outline so people who maybe don't understand or uh, haven't come across the platform know what what it's all about yeah absolutely well first uh again my apologies for tardiness um uh, time zones always still get us um and i want to give a huge thanks to our for putting this together you know like 10 years is a lot of time obviously and uh it's just a, it's such a huge landmark and um I'm so appreciative of the community that's been built around this kind of um, passion for history and sharing and, and discovering stories. So I'm really grateful to still be doing this work after all this time. Um, I kind of want to give, we've been around 10 years too. Our, our, it, James, your, your first pin was before the public launch. The public launch was in ah. <laughs> June of 2011, and that's when I joined the team. Um, and I was just thinking this morning of how different my life was then. Um, you know, I had two young kids and was trying to make ends meet and um, really felt that, that this idea of, of sharing historical photos and finding them on maps was, was going to be a game changer. <laughs> I don't know. We were all, we all still are just crazy for this kind of stuff. Um, and I think at that time, I was remembering back to, that uh, you know the smartphones had become ubiquitous and we were really discovering everything in the palms of our hands and i think it kind of the, the map factor of that like what we wanted to see on maps was was what was so important and that's what um 
for me at the time, I was working on a project called Look Back Maps, um, a passion project. Uh, and, I, and I was a tech, tech consultant in San Francisco and I was working with a lot of different libraries and archives and just trying to show them how if you could, if you could put your data out there in a way that developers can use it, we can build all kinds of great things. It doesn't necessarily need to be each library or organization that builds something. And that's how I got into this. Uh, and History Pin um, was getting going over in London with, uh, at, at the time the organization was called We Are What We Do, and it later became Shift um, some years later. And they had gotten a Google startup grant to feature kind of the maps and street view technology in a way that had a social uh, mission to it. And that mission quite simply was um, trying to connect people across generations and cultures through local history and, and ultimately to build community around that. So that's where History Pin um, started in, in June of 2011. We launched at the Museum of the City of New York. Um, I joined the team uh, to sort of help out on the U.S. side, and um, we created a nonprofit on this side too to support it and and eventually we started getting grants in the US um, in addition to to the UK and Europe and eventually Australia we had an, an office in Australia for a little while and um, it was amazing to see this kind of catch on around the world and uh, we've been through eight major um, iterations of the site since then um, and we're uh, really happy to announce that we recently got a National Endowment for the Humanities grant to redesign the site and really dig deeper into um, digital humanities uses of history pen. And I think when we see a lot of the tools that are out there, um, you know, you can do different things on, on each of the different platforms. And, and one of the things that I think we've really focused on for history pen is the ability to um, collaborate with others around projects. So not only to um, put up a pin of something in your life or of, a, of an organization's life, town's life, et cetera, but also to connect to others um, around that. So before I, before I just, I don't know, I could start driving around a little bit, but I also wanna, I wanna mention that um, we've gone through some serious changes and um, starting about four years ago, we really started to reassess whether or not we were meeting the social mission. So for as much success as we've had, um, you know, we've raised over $7 million that has gone into local history projects through History Pin over that 10 years. Um, we had, you know, over 300,000 pins up there, 100,000 users. You know, those are great numbers and great success, but were we really meeting our social mission as a nonprofit organization? Were we really connecting people in, in ways that we thought were meaningful? And we started to do some kind of self-analysis on that. And um, we ended up creating another project called Storybox. Uh, and the what we had found was while, yes, there was great stuff up there, yes, people were connecting, Occasionally, the actual social impact was coming from two people sitting down together and talking and sharing stories. You know, whether they did that around a photograph or not didn't really matter. And um, so we kind of spent a couple years really digging deep and, you know, honestly not spending a whole lot of time on the History Pin platform, but, but taking this sidetrack to Storybox. Um, and I'll just, I'll put that up real quick so you can kind of see where that went. Um, Yeah, and I guess if, I'm not sure what this will look like when I share the screen, but tell me if it doesn't look good. I think Bahur has to change a setting somewhere. Oh, he does? Okay, here we go. Yeah. So share screen. And there we go. Oh, I see, application window. Okay, sorry, we're all learning technology as we go here. Story box, boom. Um, so this is this is the site. So everything I share obviously will be online so you can dig deeper. So onestoryclosser.org is the URL. And oh, there's Nicole from our team, a graduate of our team. Um, 
And this was supported by Knight Foundation and the Institute for Museum and Library Services. And essentially what we did was we took the technology piece out and uh, we took the photos out and we just had these story prompts. And so people were able to ask these questions. And we found in terms of social impact, this had a much greater um, efficacy of, of being able to connect folks. And we found it getting, you know, started getting used. We were really focused on use within libraries. That's been our focus is, is cultural heritage organizations um, around the world. And uh, after two years of really focusing on this, we've started to now bring this back into History Pin because with working with cultural partners, um, there's kind of this constant question of what are we saving or what are we preserving? How are we, how are we displaying this? And so these might be stories that ended up up on the wall, um, but ultimately there was this kind of desire to share them. So that's just kind of a, like a side thing of, of what we've been doing in the last few years. I'll also note that um, we've now, History Pin, the History Pin project is housed within Shift Collective. So our US side of the organization, um, which has stayed really focused on culture and cultural memory, um, we've broke off um, and uh, launched Shift Collective this past year. And I'll just show you that site too. You can see it's shiftcollective.us. And um, it's another kind of reinvention. So History Pin is one of our core um, products, but we also have a number of other things, um, including documenting the now, which my colleague Burgess Jules runs. And um, you can see here a little bit more information about each of these um, products. <laughs> documenting the now is about archiving um, social media and doing it in a way that uh, is ethical and safe particularly for activists. Um, it's an amazing project. It started uh, after F Ferguson protests and really the dawn of the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States and now around the world. Um, a really critical project. And um, History Pen has become more and more focused on supporting community-based archives, as we call them, or small community organizations, places that don't necessarily consider themselves archives, but have amazing holdings. And um, Shift Collective is uh, mainly it's me, uh, Burgess, and my colleague Lynette Johnson, who's also here in New Orleans, which is where I live now. I moved uh, here from San Francisco in 2016. And um, if we look at now what, where History Pin sits amongst the work that we do, and, and basically a lot of what we've done in the last few years is, is people have come to us um, you know, different organizations have come to History Pin and they're looking for ways to, um, you know, to connect to audiences and they feel like they have a technology problem. And actually they usually don't, they usually have a community engagement problem. And that's what we've focused on. We've kind of taken human centered design thinking and we've tweaked it a bit to be community centered design and um, creating projects that uh, really have a significant meaning around the world. And I'm gonna show you a couple of these as examples. These are some of our big case studies. But before I do that, maybe James, <laughs> you asked one question. Do you, do you wanna ask anything else? No, no, I'm more than happy for you to keep going. I mean, I, I do have a question. It might You might park this and, and wait, but I, I was fascinated, uh, particularly, I guess, in the context of History Pin, but all the other projects as to the spread of users between like, Joe Public individuals in a way like I am in this con in the context of a history pin user, just yeah. a personal collector wants to share images versus, you know, and I with a Flickr account or whatever, versus the kind of small community groups versus an institutional collection right up to sort of large scale stuff. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we, you know, when we started in 2011, when we launched, we were really looking towards individual users. But at that same time, um, the team at the time was reaching out to um, a lot of different uh, archival collections as well, sort of to seed it, right, so that there were some things on the map. And when we uh, when we switched over to, um, well, it was really kind of our first major. Uh, tweak to the interface, we created these profile pages. And that enabled particularly institute, small cultural heritage organizations, institutions to create their sites. So we now have 
um, by our best estimate, about 4,000 or more um, uh, cultural heritage organizations. And if I, go, if I click over, I just did that quickly, but I went to collections and then history pin members. This just sorts by popular and you can kind of see, you know, some of these have been up here a long time, but in, and some, some of these have also been major partners of ours, but like the National Archives, Archives of, National Archives of Quebec, um, you know, some towns, State Library of Queensland, we've done a lot of work with them, ben Benevolent Society, Society, that's in uh, Australia, State Library of New South Wales. You kind of get down and then you see, look, here's photos of the past. Shows <laughs> exactly. up like in the front page, that's you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that, 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 that time, picture these are some other smaller ones, ceramic city <laughs> stories. So it's, it's a mix, but we find that um, for the most part, um, the, the users that we're designing for, and, and maybe this is to a fault, um, have been small organizational users. Um, and then maybe a little less so bigger institutions. Obviously the bigger institutions have more content, they get more looks, um, but they also don't necessarily need this kind of technology in the same way because they end up building their own things from time I'm to time. I'm not sure I've ever been ranked alongside the Smithsonian before, but there you go. <laughs> You're just right behind them, and and you're above the city of Richmond. Um, you're above the history pen team, man. <laughs> I love it. Give them a kick. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm gonna be. I'm looking at the questions too here as as we go. Are the data and images shared with other platforms? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I yeah. was on the wrong comment thread. It's okay. Well. It's okay. I'm just. I'm keeping an eye on those a little bit too. I'll, I'll have to go back between the private chat too. Okay. Um, no, so I'll, I'll keep an eye on the questions. Don't worry, John. Okay, um, cool. Flag me for flag me for those. Yeah, because actually, the one Bob's asked is something I was going to ask you anyway. So. Okay, cool. We'll get to the we'll get to a little bit of the back end too. But maybe let me show you. Um, these are case studies that we have up on the Shift Collective site right now, and um, they go into a couple major uh, endeavors. Um, Comparte to Rojo. This one started in 2016. I want to say it was a partnership with the National Library of Colombia and. Um, this gives you a little bit more detail behind the scenes, what you see on the Shift Collective site, which is helpful. Um, this was a nationwide project uh, funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and they were basically trying to increase technology use through public libraries. So trying to reach individual users across the country um, through, through the public libraries themselves. And these were in a wide variety of libraries, um, large and small across the country, over 900 libraries participated, which um, was, they have about 1400 libraries total. So if you had enough bandwidth and, um, you know, you could participate in this program. And they, they basically created, and there's a little video here, I won't show it now, but this is really nice kind of behind the scenes of, of that project too. And there's also a book chapter um, that I wrote with my colleague Diego uh, Marizalde, who was the project lead in Colombia on this. Um, it's in uh, 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 a museum's textbook, I guess. I don't know who reads museum textbooks, some people apparently. But uh, you can actually get the article itself there. And a bunch of the authors of that book have, have shared their articles um, in an open source. So if you, if you Google that book title, you'll probably find that. Anyway, the amazing thing about this project was, and, and this is one of my favorites, obviously, because it had such traction and it went, it reached so far um, into the countryside and at such a critical time. So at the time, they were coming towards sort to the end of 52 years of violent conflict, and there was a vote actually to create um, a peace treaty, essentially. And um, well, I was so yeah, it was definitely it was 2016 because we had uh, just elected. Trump's uh, office uh, when they were having that and uh, Brexit was starting to get spin up. Some crazy shit was going on around the world in that year. And um, anyway, what was amazing was we found that, and I'll just click over to the project itself. Um, what we found was that people were sharing these amazing images of um, what was, what their recollection of history was, what was important to them. And it turned out to be a lot of community events, um, jazz music, bike riding, all kinds of things. And, and you can see here, this is like, this is kind of what we call a showcase site. Uh, this is um, 
gives kind of instructions for what or background of what the project is, how to participate, some inspirational photos to get your library going. But then when you go into the collection and you can see this one was sort of customized to meet their, um, to meet their framework as well, uh, slowly loading. And if we scroll down a little bit, we can just see this map. Uh, you know, over 10,000, oh, they're at over 11,000 pins now. It continues to grow. The funding ended two years ago, and it was um, libraries continue to join in. And if you, get, if you just pop into, like, any of these, it's a, what's also amazing was I had no idea Google Street View was freaking everywhere in Colombia. So if you go down to these little towns and areas, um, you'll see that there's kinds of – Street, well, actually, let's just filter the map here. This is a little uh, shortcut. If you type HAS, it gives you some options here for Street View, and you can also type in has comments, and it'll it'll give you a filter for comments. So this shows us any of the Street View ones. Let's zoom in a little bit more to sort of some random part of the country. You'll also notice um, we're History Pin, we don't really put it out there that much. It's mainly used for projects, but History Pin is available in a number of languages. You can see we've switched to Spanish um, with ES afterwards. It's also available in French, Greek, Hebrew, and Arabic. We're just launched too um, as a part of a project in Israel, which is uh, really exciting and, and difficult because those languages go right to left. So you can kind of get us, these, these are showing us here. Let me, let's pop into a smaller place where you wouldn't think you would have street views. And you can kind of see, here we go, we've got churches, we've got ceremonies, you know, things that, that really mark the, the lives of the people of Colombia. And at this time when they were trying to create this, um, you know, get into this peace treaty to, find, to end this years and years of violent conflict that affected almost everyone in the country, um, this was a real bonding experience for people. And so we, we actually did a bit of a study to see what the social impact was of this. And um, that's this is back to the Shift Collective site. Um, they noted that there was increased intergenerational and intercultural dialogue, a 12% increase in social cohesion um, based on a study that they did um, comparing libraries that participated in this versus those that didn't. So not only was it a really cool project, have amazing reach, but it also um, showed that you could create social cohesion from this kind of work. Um, and then let me just go back here to some of these other projects real quick to show you some of the different directions we've gone. Um, this was a National Archives project that was four years running and uh, helped push our technology quite a bit as well. It's, um, we worked with teachers around the country. We also helped the National Archives um, start to assess who their audiences were. It was the first time that the National Archives actually took on a project that worked across units. So never before had, um, you know, moving images worked with the, the, you know, the social media team or something like that. They, they'd kind of been one-to-one -one, and this was, we actually got several different um, departments within the National Archives to work together. Um, well, of course, they got them to work together. This was an opportunity for them to do so, and also to really start to understand who their audiences were and who they wanted them to be. Uh, so that's another cool one to look at. We also, and this gets to the API question, we did launch an API as part of this project, and um, we had another team develop a um, an app that was, it was kind of a tablet app that was meant to be used in classes. Um, so that was uh, an amazing uh, part of that project that we created. And the API, if you, I think if you just, I'll just do this real quick. If we just Google history pin API, it should bring you to um, our, uh, GitHub page. And is that available across all the content then? Um, it is, but I'm, I was hoping to find, I was hoping to find 
the actual details about here it is it should have been easier to find probably it's not something that we put out there because we don't we really don't have the ability to support it much but you can kind of get started on your own here to figure out how to run search parameters and um, do various things the main thing we've used the api for uh, the columbia project is a great example is for them to catalog um, in that project everything that was created was then cataloged um, as part of the the permanent collections at the national archives of columbia all right, so I'm going to take a breath again and, and pause for, <laughs> for your questions because I'm just going off. Um, I did want to say, too, like we're, you know, in terms of shoe, shoestring budgets and making things work, you know, the last couple of years, many of our major projects have ended. And so um, uh, we ended up bringing History Pin over to the U.S. It's now housed under Shift Collective. And um, it's mainly me and my colleague, Lynette Johnson, who work on History Pin, and then uh, Sasha uh, in uh, Sofia, Bulgaria, Alexander Ivanov, who is the, he's architected this whole system and he continues to support it. So it's really just the three of us um, and it's not any of our full-time work at this point, um, even though it's something that we continue to support. With the NEH grant, that's gonna change. And we're really looking at uh, ways to partner with other organizations, national institutions in a way that uh, we just haven't been able to do in, in some time. So that's, we're excited about that. So shall I ping you another question? Yeah, hit me another, hit me another question. But let me say real quick, if you go to recent news on the Shift Collective site, you'll see the, the details about this history pin, um, the award from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And, and there is actually a very detailed PDF here about the first round, um, which was a $50,000 design grant, basically. And then the, the next round is to start to implement some of those designs. And it shows some of the the new look of history pen that we've started to look at is, as well as um, some of the digital humanities projects that are going to be showcased as part of that. Cool. Thanks. Um, so we talked a little bit there about who the users are in terms of, I mean, it always strikes me on these platforms that a lot of people refer to users as the people who are using the tools and uploading the content. Yeah. Um, I also have an interest in who are the users who then visit that content and consume it um and i just wondered partly in terms of the types of content that are in the site and then if you do know anything about the kind of end users in terms of quantity quality <laughs> yeah i i don't have a whole lot of that data um right now in terms of the end users i think like like i mentioned i think we've sort of designed to a fault for the contributors Mm. And for, you know, kind of I look at it as almost like a, a B2B type approach, you know, like a business to business kind of thing where we're really focused on enabling organizations to do what they need to do with the site as opposed to just random people. I mean, when you go to the History Pin site, this is a, a major fault of the site to me, um, is that it's not easy to just dig in and find something. You have to first put in a location. And then if you go there, you know, if you go to San Francisco... It's a, it's a real mess, honestly. You know, you'd be lucky just to stumble across something. You wouldn't know to look for that Columbia project unless I told you. Um, you know, obviously there's great there's great stuff here, but there's a lot of, you know, to be honest, there's there's stuff that's not so great or that's not so meaningful to, to for what I'm looking for. And I think in our next iteration, that's something that we really want to focus on more is is what is this how does history pin exist as as kind of a media property? What does it look like if people are trying to um, find things? So typically, what what we find is that people are um, using the or particularly small organizations are using this as a way to connect to their communities. You know, this is an example of um, the Museum of North Victoria. Uh, they just created this. Uh, this is what we call an advanced project because it has. Um, the ability to do a few things like have that header image and you can do historical map overlays, things like that. But this was really to connect with this community and start to showcase exhibits that they have in their museum. And so people would just go to that and see that. So 
Um, what happens when they're there is hard to say. You know, we, we really, I looked recently at our, our user stats and we're probably getting 2,000 visits a month. You know, so your, your, your project is way more popular than ours uh, at this point. That's good SEO for you. When you've got yeah. a, a million people with names, they, they, yeah. It's just, yeah, that's just amazing. Well, that's true. That's, that's true. But, it, but um, and we find that they stay for about three minutes or so, I think was what my last week. And that's, yeah. and that's up when we did some analysis for the NEH grant. And some of that is in the, in the report that I showed you that you could read up on. Um, we found that we were, well, in fact, let's just look at it. Cause I don't remember these things off the top of my head. Um, I'm pretty sure I can find this really quick is, is, is what the stats were particularly after we launched um so if i can just i'm slightly conscious of time actually john oh so yeah 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 yeah. we're it's already 22 and i'm sure there's plenty of other well hit me with hit me with other questions and interesting I'll bits we can get up. i mean i was interested in then then in terms of i from my impression of the content i've shared on history pin i haven't had much engagement i haven't had comments particularly yeah. and so on um so do you, do you find that that's, you know, you talk about these community archives, do you, do you find that people are, are sharing them on the platform or do you think they're sharing them off the platform and then there's those discussions are going on there? Because certainly with a street near you, the, the discovery I made was just how many thousands and thousands and thousands of local Facebook groups there are out there. Yeah. Talk, sure. Talking specifically about local history. Yep. Um, and that, concerns me because that's where all the dialogue's happening and not, and it's come up before this afternoon um during during the talks this afternoon you know that none of that knowledge is being really captured in any form back to more sort of um open platforms yeah for sure i mean to be honest i think that's that's a major question and one of the um, projects that we've been working with for a number of years now, in fact, that we have a little case study about these guys, is um, Memories of Migration, or sorry, uh, it's called Manitos Community Memory Project out of northern New Mexico. And um, they're actually really digging deep into this question where they had a Facebook history group about this tiny community of which I think like maybe 100 people live there, but there were 3,000 people in the group. And so they had all this amazing, um, you know, photographs that were being shared, stories that were being shared, because that's where people are. And honestly, if I was building history pen again today, if I was starting from scratch, I think I'd probably build a face, some kind of Facebook app, you know, um, figuring out how to get that stuff out of Facebook and into the. And so we're seeing some intersection with the work that Burgess has done in terms of archiving social media content. Um, but this Manitos Community Memory Project is a great example of how do you actually connect with people? Um, how do you connect with people where they are, like on Facebook, and bring them or bring that to a kind of an archival perspective? On History Pin, no, there's not a ton of connections that are being made. Um, you're not seeing a lot of comment action, um, mainly because I think people have to create a History Pin account. And, and, you know, so that's another thing we might do if I was building it from scratch or if I'm rebuilding it, making it easy for people to just use their Facebook thing. But yeah, like we thought this was going to, 10 years ago, this was going to be the Facebook for local history. That was the whole idea, right? And that's just not, <laughs> that's not well, I mean, that. You know, the, the thing that immediately springs to mind is um, uh, Findery, Katarina Fake for X. Yeah. Fake. Fame, you know that was that was the big kind of you might right. call it twitter for for local totally you know, but just didn't no happen. we we've outlasted those projects how crazy yeah. is that right like findery we outlasted freaking google what was the google project they, they had a google project for many field years trip. Field, field trip, trip? <laughs> yeah what the hell man if they can't make it work if they if you can't if katarina fake and her vc money can't make it work like how are we still doing this <laughs> Dedication. That's what it is. <laughs> and it, beautiful segue to to my next question, which was going to be around sustainability and um, you know impact and and stuff. I mean, uh, congratulations, obviously on the on the grant. Um, that almost feels 
um, unprecedented in a way in the current climate, from what I can see, mm -hmm. actually getting kind of centralized funding for a platform rather than doing a specific time limited project. That's right. It's so um, true. It's so true. I mean, that's a huge question. Everyone's asking. And we look at some of the kind of, you know, some of the folks we've been talking to lately, uh, Urban Archive is a, is a relatively new one. Um, Google actually has a new program uh, called ReCity, which is, I don't know if you've seen that one. I should throw up a link to that in a second too. Um, the, the Layers of London folks have launched something. HuMap, you connected us with them. I've been talking to them a yeah. bit too. Uh, you know, these amazing projects. And I think we all are dealing with that same struggle, like the, this, the question of how to do a, a t maximum two-year capital project versus some kind of a uh, subscription service or something like that. You know, like I said, we've raised over $7 million over 10 years that have gone into the development of this, into support of the community programs, community, um, you know, community organizers around this stuff. And that's been a huge lift. It's been like, it's been an amazing ride. I never thought we'd, we'd get to 10 years of doing that kind of a thing, especially with that kind of a model. I don't have an answer about sustainability. Um, you know, for us, it, I'll be honest with you, we kind of looked at, well, what does it look like to sunset history pin if we can't get, you know, we can't keep doing, be, you know, be, stay on this treadmill of getting the grants. And uh, we, we si sort of decided that a lot of these small community-based archives, cultural organizations just didn't have another option for a free service. And so we felt, well, let's give it one more chance. Now the question is going to be, you know, can we create sort of a freemium model? Can we, can we, create some setup so that people can pay for advanced uses? Can we partner with institutions um, that might invest in the infrastructure in order to make it available to, you know, national or uh, particular, well, I guess I would say particularly national projects where they're, they're trying to figure out how to have this two-way street for their museums or for their institutions, which we provide. I like um, the way you say, you say two-way street and there's a one-way sign up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is actually the most viewed image on History Pen. That's why we decided to put it on the cover. And it's just, you know, it was a, a black and white photo that somebody colorized and posted it on Reddit. It was originally on the site called Shorpy. And then it went up on Reddit, you know, this was probably six, six years ago or so. Right. And then people tried to figure out exactly where it was. And, and they did. They found where it was. And that was, this is kind of like, you know, that's just people having fun with history, I guess. So I don't know if I answered any questions on sustainability. I'd love to hear. I'm going to go back and, and watch everything you know, happen this morning uh, in, on my time and see if anyone else had other ideas on sustainability. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's always the one to, but I mean, it's just fascinating to hear, for example, the, the, you know, that you've now got an API, which was something I've been asking for for years. And <laughs> you didn't tell me, John. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I, what? Get out of here. But I, um you know, the notion that that came about because of another project. And I think that is the way these things will will naturally stand any chance of both kind of uh, preserving, but also evolving is yeah. just to piggyback new site developments with, with the proper kind of leadership and direction. You know, you, you, you tap into the money where you can and, and but use it towards the bigger the bigger goal. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think that's probably a pretty common model. You know, like we get a 120K project here or 20K project here. Like those, and those are direct from from projects. Uh, the, the trick too is not to let those projects lead what you're trying to do with the site. And that's that was kind of a trap we fell into for, for a number of years where we were just kind of chasing the money. And I'll also say for me, just personally and, and with the Shift Collective team, we've really you know, we have to question this nonprofit industrial complex and how it works. And, you know, what I found was, you know, we got to a point where as an executive director, I was trying to raise money to support my staff instead of trying to solve social problems. And that's the trap we fall into when we start chasing what the funders want to happen, but not what the community needs to happen. And uh, so we really changed how we, how we work at Shift Collective and I'm no longer the director. Um, you know, we really work as, as a collective, people take on projects that they think are important and we support each other in, in the fundraising or the client work as, as needs to happen. 
Um, that's something I'd like to see because really what we need to change is the philanthropy sector. Uh, I, you know, it's different in Europe, obviously, than it is in the U.S. Um, you know, I think things are supported much more by the state probably um, or by governments in, in the, the EU. I don't know. I don't know if that's true, but that's my impression. We have a lot of private funders here that, that dictate where we go. And, and I think we're, we're trying. They know they need to change and, and same for us. So. Yeah. And then, I mean, perhaps just to wrap things up uh, uh, on a much broader note, just related to today. And thank you again to Vahor for bringing all this together because it's, yeah. uh, it's really underpinned to me um, how much there is out there, um, how many great things, you know, when we're talking about whether it's local projects or, you know, software platforms, everything that, that and it, it just seems to be so much we can learn from each other and, yeah. share between the community as well so um you know just the notion I, I was you 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 were probably still fast asleep us time when um when stefan was talking about snapshot but you know it's kind of the 3d version of the oh wow of the overlaying of street view images and uh i was thinking of history pin for that you know and that's open yeah. source so you know suddenly you kind of got another potential opportunity of course we mustn't be led by the technology <laughs> we've got to be led by what 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 the um what the users need and, and want um well, well and it depends too right like for us we have a social mission that's what matters to me like i don't yeah. i can i don't give a crap about the tech i mean it's great it's important and i'm here i'm seeing some other i'm seeing some i don't know what this private chat is what is history pin somebody's asking oh i didn't say what history pin is let's figure it out um, I didn't notice that one on the press. There's a couple of chat areas here. So, so I, somebody's saying I didn't say what history pin is or how it works. I don't know how it works. You you take a f old photo and you um, pin something on the map, and that's what you can see. I think I I didn't mean to just tell you how great history pin is, although I, it wouldn't work on it for ten years if I didn't think it was great. Um, you know, essentially, basically, people are putting pins on maps. And I'll show you a quick example of that. Here's uh, Greenwood. I don't know if anyone's heard about this over your way, but in 1921, there was uh, a massacre that wiped out the black, tried to wipe out the black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we're seeing um, some recreation of those, uh, of that. Let me see if I can just do the search. So at the at the core of it, you know, in terms of how this how this works, you know, you're, it's really about taking a an, an image and um, putting that on a map. And you can use uh, Google Street View as as one of the things that you use to kind of line it up and see what's there now and what was there before. Um, we have these pro kind of special projects, funded projects, where you can put historical maps as an overlay and find your way around it. And you can tell stories. You can create tours um, that give some sort of narrative. And here we've we've got different views of this um, of this particular area of Tulsa, Oklahoma, from different periods. So the period up until the massacre, um, you know, in which this entire area was firebombed um, and destroyed, and then the period after that, 1921, where the community rebuilt, uh, and then only to be slapped in the face during uh, redevelopment in the 50s, 60s, and 70s where they um, paved the highway through. But now you have the ability to see how that how that happened and how that came about over time. So I'm hoping that answers that little question about what it is. <laughs> That's pretty much simply what it is. And what else do some I missed this comment too. You have a similar sustainability problem, yeah. yeah. Yeah, get a temporary project twice, perhaps, and it's yeah, absolutely. You know, it's not, and and maybe part of that is not set up for digital sustainability. Um, you know, like what this what this might look like um, if we had a sustainable support structure in place. Um, hard to say. I mean, just just picking up again then on Alexander's sort of point i mean do you, do you think there's there's potentially an issue here when you compare it with a, a platform like 
topper tech he was talking about earlier which again you, you wouldn't have heard so you wouldn't have seen yeah. but they've started very very local and had incredible success by maintaining that focus and they're very sort of steadily expanding as they're being approached um to sort of develop it for new communities has an issue do you right. think history pin been that it's been too big too broad and not enough focus as to exactly what it can deliver because obviously I've seen it through some of the, the the specific projects, some of them that you've outlined now. But you know, it it there. I think there is an issue for some of these platforms that there, there's not a that clear single yeah selling point that people understand immediately. Well, I, I like the idea of starting local. I think that's a great way to do it. I don't know if history pen necessarily is too big, but it does become a question of scale or interface, right? And and I'm not familiar with Topotech. I'm happy, I'm excited to learn more about it. Um, but watching like Urban Archive that's coming up too, you know, they've been around for three or four years now, also a nonprofit. Um, I love their work, I love the tech. And it's similar, right? Like they're focused on New York City right now. And then they're starting to do a couple other locations, it looks like. And, and you know, I think that it's really useful for a local perspective. I think that makes a ton of sense. I think what we tried to do with History Pen is make it so that anyone could pick it up and, and run with it, basically. So from a discovery perspective or from a media property or even from a journalism perspective, it's kind of a mess that way. You know, there's not a clear entry in if you don't have that local that local lens. So I it, that I like the local lens; it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, we've come to fifty-five. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's any more questions that have come up in the chat. Um, and it may be a chance for everybody to have a five-minute break and get a drink before we go on to the final session where Bahur takes center stage finally the finale uh, <laughs> with uh, with Mia in um, in the moderator role so sorry oh, nice. if I've possibly dominated the conversation here by throwing questions at you but uh, certainly been interesting to get an update as to to where history pin is at so thank you John yeah thanks everyone and uh, thank you James and thanks Fahur, for organizing this uh, really great to, to still be doing this work with everyone I appreciate it Cheers. All right.
So, hello. Oh, let me check if I have the audio. Oh. Amia, you are muted. Yeah, not anymore. Yes, yes, that's better. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, it's a long. It's been a long afternoon, and uh, and and so very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, you weren't able to be here before, but uh, but for for me personally, it has been really really interesting to learn about all these other similar projects and. Um, and, and of course, I was uh, the selfish idea behind it was to to learn more about and uh, more in detail about the project. So, uh, so now it's it's the hard task to wrap the day up with a presentation of uh, a wire bike uh, that I'm running myself. And uh, I I I will combine slides and also some live demoing. So I I don't have a Perfect uh, uh, slide deck, uh, as, as Vikram did, for instance. Uh, uh, but uh, so, but uh, but I, I really uh, want to maybe also reflect on some of the topics that that came up uh, during the day in the in the previous presentation. And so, uh, for you, Mia, please feel free to uh, interrupt me also with the question. So, as, as it as it won't be such a uh, uh, like full presentation. But uh, but maybe I think uh, we are students maybe are a bit unceremonial also and, and I think it's easier for you to uh, to also uh, uh, introduce yourself uh, uh, with what what you are doing what's your uh, connection I know also but but how you are working in the field of crowdsourcing and etc. So, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, it's interesting thinking about the ten year milestone because I. Um, first created crowdsourcing games for museums about 10 years ago myself, um, uh, working with Images from the Science Museum and the Powerhouse Museum. Um, I currently work as a digital curator at the British Library where I run um, crowdsourcing projects through LibCrowds and also on a data science project called Living with Machines. Um, it sort of very neatly draws together my interest in crowdsourcing as a form of public engagement around collections encouraging people to access and view collections, but also thinking about the future of crowdsourcing and the challenges of new technologies that um, increasingly can perform some of the tasks that we would previously crowdsource. Um, not to the same extent, but there are with things like handwritten text recognition, um, image processing, computer vision. Um, the field has changed just immeasurably in the last 10 years. So I think this has been a great way of bringing together um, those different, uh, how projects have responded to those changes and um, how the context in which we're working has just changed quite a lot over that time. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, also in today's presentations, uh, we had uh, a presentation from uh, Switzerland, the snapshot that is really, really focusing on, on landscape images and geotagging in a three, 3D uh, on a 3D globe, actually, so it was really impressive. I also didn't didn't know about all the details there. And then, then next was uh, Civil War Photo Sleuth uh, that uh, that uses uh, face recognition uh, and and also specializes in in one specific task of identifying persons. Uh, so indeed, it, it's it's a really <clears throat> interesting uh, field and and a lot. And the, uh, and the technology is, is enabling us things that were not unimaginable ten years ago. Uh, so uh, I tried to do the live uh, live editing as well. So um, uh, I mean the editing of the stream. Let me start with sharing my screen as well. Um, <clears throat> Hmm. Yeah, and now I've got some issue with the computer frozen. Uh, I think perhaps your computer's had quite a long day. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I, at least I have several computers, so this, <laughs> this one is streaming. <laughs> uh, and uh, yes, indeed, it seems it. Okay, then um, hmm. 
Uh, let's. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yes, let's. One. Yes, okay, now we have it. Here and here. And okay, and it's also yes. So, <clears throat> so also as uh, uh, to to keep context or, uh, to our project uh, Ayabike, so it is it is run by uh, by a small non-profit organization <clears throat> called uh, uh, Estonian Photographic Heritage Society. So it's it's really a small. Um, uh, association of people who are working in uh, uh, on positions related to photographic collections. So these are collection keepers, and then we have a uh, uh, twenty-four members only. So it's it's a really really a small uh, organization, and I'm I'm the only paid staff member working on this Sirebike um, application. So <clears throat> and this is our has 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 grown to be our big, biggest uh, project and. Um, and uh, as I as as I was telling, yes, it was before the um, uh, last presentation. So uh, it was uh, ten years ago, um, exactly on February twenty fifth. Uh, it was a Friday then that that the hackathon started uh, here in Tallinn. A carriage forty eight hackathon. It's a series of hackathons, and and uh, where our bike was born. But actually, uh, the idea that I had. Uh, I had I had had the idea already before. So for me also the uh, uh, big inspiration was uh, Flickr Commons when that started in 2008, of course, and um, and then there was a, a small Flickr plugin uh, called Suggestify. Uh, that that's that's not there anymore, and uh, it's I think Aaron Stroke Cope uh, was the author of it, and and who and the idea was that. Uh, that other users can suggest locations to other users' pictures, and uh, and so in in 2008 I I wrote uh, in the Estonian Museum magazine I wrote an article about uh, crowdsourcing and and let's help let's let's bring or let's ask the people to join in the process of describing the images uh, etc and then I, I presented at a conference in uh, Vilnius Lithuania in 2009 so basically this the idea was was um, uh, was ready and then one of the key features of our bike since the beginning also was that um, uh, the idea to to separate the uh, the flow of let's say of, uh, adding a picture online and, and describing it into into separate micro tasks uh, so that uh, different users can do different things and I think this is was, was maybe also something that was was uh, different on our bike uh, from uh, from other other similar sites that uh, uh, sorry is that uh, <clears throat> uh, that also, I, I mean, for early, early on on other other sites like History Pin, I think, uh, and uh, so that the user who uploaded the content also had to do all the other things, also to put it to pin it on the map, etc. Whereas, as I uh, myself have background in um, in uh, museums and in the museum collections and academic background in geography, uh, I, I studied geography, so the I, idea was that actually. The problem is that in the museum collections there we have uh, thousands of images uh, that do not have geographical information uh, connected to the, these images, and the collection keepers are not able to provide the uh, geographic coordinates to all of these images. And I think there is a. Uh, I always I like to uh, show this um, uh, this. Um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, proceeding of a, of a case study about uh, geocoded uh, digital cultural content from early 2012 also and there are some some ideas that have uh, so nicely been put uh, that uh, how, how important actually this uh, geographic location is and um, in order to to um, uh, make this content available 
uh, for a, in a more user friendly way. Uh, but I, I guess uh, yes. Uh, so this is uh, this is common to all all the platforms that we have uh, also today um, heard about. So um, and that was really also the idea uh, for our bike since the beginning that uh, that how to make these. Um, uh, this content uh, searchable or findable in an easier way, and and of course the the problem is that uh, that current that then and I think this is still uh, the case today that the content is mostly only searchable by text, and and there is no uh, location metadata or, or there is very little location metadata for for uh, these pictures and and also for instance in the estonian context uh, as a small country uh, and we celebrated our day, day of independence yesterday by the way uh, so uh, we have uh, had um, uh, we've been occupied several times and one act of uh, uh, power is renaming the streets for instance so uh, the streets in estonia uh, the squares, etc., have have had very different names over the course of the even the last hundred hundred fifty years. Let's say the the mm, the time that photography is there. So uh, and usually the the um, descriptions of the images originate from the era of the pictures, or at least when the picture is taken into the collection. And now during the digitization, also uh, these descriptions are transcribed. I mean, uh, or, or uh, but but they uh, they are not uh, usually they are not updated so that uh, that uh, the, it's also part of the museological history that we know that how this picture or how how this street was was named but uh, but it makes it much more diff difficult to use for instance automatic geocoding in, in order to uh, retrieve con uh, coordinates from the from the textual uh, d description of the address and and so this was the f the idea that that uh, that we need to have users engaged in um, in this task of geotagging content and and since the very beginning we also had the second task so uh, uh, and also i think very very common thing uh, now when digital imagery is available is this uh, task of uh, uh, Rephotography, or uh, then and now pictures, and uh, I think that uh, the, it, they are very, very much interconnected. That when we, at first, uh, pin an old picture on the map, and we know like where exactly it was, uh, uh, when where the photographer was standing, and what was the direction of the view, then the next question is how does this place look like today? So for for those people who recognize this place, they have it. Uh, uh, they they know it uh, like they have it in their mental map, but uh, in order to make these historic pictures uh, um, to speak more to also the people who don't know these places, this uh, rephotographs is a great way to illustrate the changes that have taken place over the uh, over the course of the years. So uh, this is this was the the way we we started our bike. And uh, yes, okay. The first task was geotagging. Okay, there's a screenshot of uh, of uh, our first interface. So uh, we started with pictures from uh, from Tallinn, and um, and then uh, then then the uh, uh, then the other pictures uh, from other towns of Est Estonian towns were added, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, and also. So we we when we think about the task of geotagging, so there is also uh, like what are we geotagging? So um, I guess I don't have time to go too much into detail about that, but I, I think that even if we have geotags, for instance, if the official repositories in the museums, if there are geotags, then usually these are uh, geocoded and from the address of the object that is on the picture. So this, if we have these pins on the map, they are rather sitting on top of the buildings. Uh, whereas we focused on the camera location, so like where was where was the photographer standing? And there were several reasons. One one was that it it is what is needed in order to make the photograph, and the other is also that actually this camera location is uh, finite, so it's uh, it's only one uh, <clears throat> one possible um, uh, location for for where the photographer was. Whereas 
we, we can have so many, many different objects or buildings uh, on one picture. So we have a church in the background and then some, some, uh, some other buildings in, the, in, in front. So we need to have several, we, we can have several uh, uh, object or location geotags about one specific image. And, um, and so, yes, uh, the second task was re-photography. And the idea is that, um, that we have these uh, uh, then and now pictures in a, in a comparable, uh, comparable way. And, um, and, uh, and so it's, and this was, this was how we started. So also a couple of words. So, uh, the first working version we got ready by the end of the weekend so uh, it was 48 hours this hackathon uh, so uh, the IR bike was born on february 27 uh, 2011 and that we got the first working version ready and then um, then of course there was also some issues of ownership or i mean how to how to sustain or how to continue with the project we had some some uh, this kind of development sessions but uh, but still it wasn't until the end of 2012 when i decided to dedicate myself to the project entirely uh, that that things started to move forward more and it was then another hackathon that we uh, attended where we created the first version of the iabike mobile app uh, with the task of rephotography, so the the aim of the mobile app is really to to enable this rephotography in a very in an in an easy way, with the idea that um, that we can display on uh, on the on our devices screen uh, the historic image and then so really align it uh, with the uh, with the contemporary view and in, in order to be able to make this re-photograph so so uh, this this was um, uh, what what we did the first version was in two thousand in the end of 2012 uh, but then also we discovered that the bottleneck is um, is uh, curation of the uh, content. Uh, so uh, where to get? So the, the principle of geotagging worked very well. So uh, we we saw that people uh, uh, do this job of geotagging, put pictures on the map, and we didn't have enough content, in, enough historic image imagery available for them. So it wasn't until early 2015. So it was still several years uh, uh, that we we made this connection to Estonian local uh, local uh, on the state level, let's say, uh, museums uh, repository. So we have one main central repository for all the museums uh, that uh, that has uh, has an API, and and so we connected IABI platform to to this museums repository and and created uh, this kind of a so-called curator view in iabike where users can make searches uh, and um, and then query content from uh, from these uh, museums collections and then uh, select images and then uh, uh, send this these images to iabike platform and um, so currently currently this museums uh, Database is not here, but but let's say the idea is that uh, that uh, we have now uh, uh, these are the names of the repositories. So we have also Finnish Finnish uh, uh, central repository available, and then Wikimedia Commons Europeana. But that we we make a text search here and then select images and add these to the to the platform. And I think it's good to have a graph here to illustrate uh, this that. Um, uh, that uh, this is this this was when when we had this explosion in the or the content started to grow so um, and the blue line here is the number uh, the uh, overall number of content and the uh, red one is is uh, geotag content and and uh, yellow is uh, is uh, con uh, pictures uh, that have been re photographed um, and. And also, as I mentioned earlier, that the idea was that all these tasks are are open to everybody. So, uh, uh, but but of course, um, 
not not everybody is doing all the tasks and and also to uh, uh, like as full disclosure so 75 percent of the content on iabike i have curated uh, so i have made these searches and and added this content um, uh, to our bike and then the one quarter is is uh, is by other other users um, <clears throat> and um, uh, so uh, yes uh, and so this these were the the main task the first task that we were using and of course there was there were several um, other ideas that we had since the very beginning and and uh, the implementation of these ideas was was postponed for um, for uh, some time and um, uh, but of course one of the things is that and it's also very interesting today i think to to uh, learn about the other projects that that uh, and i think that this kind of specialization actually might be a very good idea so uh, uh that we we have gone the other way and and probably and it, it's it's it makes it harder too that that so it's since two years ago we added a number of new tasks and and one of them was of course um, was uh tagging persons so <clears throat> uh, that we have this option of okay maybe maybe it's easy to go live that that if we see a picture and uh, there is a person on the on the on the picture, then we can we can indicate uh, or we can actually identify the person, or uh, or uh, or also one uh, one specific microtask about this uh, pictures depicting depicting people is, for instance, only tag the age and gender group age group and gender of the of the person on the picture and then this is again the idea is that actually we can um, uh, <clears throat> uh, that we can do something that, that this is a task that we can do without knowing who is on the picture and and so every human can can basically identify that okay i wonder if these have okay this isn't hasn't been identified either it's an adult male here and and the idea is that uh, with this kind of small um, small steps, so, um, um, we can actually. So it's a child. I I guess it's it's a girl. So uh, what it does is that we can uh, later on, if somebody is looking for for uh, pictures of his or her grandfather, uh, so we we actually we only need to show uh, male faces. Uh, or even I I, um, I use this example of if uh, <clears throat> historical images can have a very different use, so they can be used as an illustration only for for um, <clears throat> uh, to illustrate something. So, for instance, if uh, for Saint Valentine's card we want to have a historic photograph of a, uh, of a man and a, and a woman, then then we basically we need to have a way to search for pictures that only have one man and a woman. And then to to uh, uh, to choose from these pictures, so we even don't don't need to know who is on the pictures, but but we want something specific. Or for the grandparents' day, we want to have a picture with an old lady with um, uh, with uh, children, uh, etc. So this is again uh, this kind of a small um, small micro task, and uh, and then. Um, but of course, I mean that uh, I know in the in the first uh, first uh, session today about Topotech, there were also the questions were asked about rights, etc. And uh, uh, so both copyright and and privacy uh, and all these issues. And and also Alexander from Topotech said that uh, um, they are working in in kind of a gray 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 area or gray zone. And and it it is exactly the same for us. So. Uh, uh, and this was something uh, the reason why we also i think we we were not really uh, implementing this uh, face tagging for quite long um, about but then I, I also felt that uh, we need to do it because it's it is also needed and um, and the picture of a person is <clears throat> is this kind of private data but but also the situation is that and of course it gets more uh, the uh, all these ethical and privacy uh, issues are 
uh, get more uh, more and more urgent if the material is new and so if, if but also we can have in the museum's collections we can have uh, pictures from the 20th century where people are people are still living but the thing is that uh, these pictures are online already now without the identification so it can actually happen that uh, it's this kind of a chicken egg thing i think that uh, that only after somebody recognizes a person on the picture this person him or herself might be able to find this picture of, of himself so um, and and then the question is if this person does not like this picture to be public uh, then of course there is this all this take down uh, things etc and um, and at the same time also i know that there's a lot of uh, historic content is going to to uh, wiki platforms and uh, wikimedia commons for instance but then there is also this issue that uh, wikimedia commons is very strict about uh, uh, about copyright so we need to we need to know exactly what's the copyright status of the of the content that gets put on wikimedia commons uh, whereas in the context of uh, photographic collections in the museums uh, uh, so huge, huge amounts of pictures uh, are, have uh, unclear copyright statuses. So actually, also being able to to identify identify people and places on the pictures, it, it can also help um, uh, uh, to correct the attributions of the of the pictures. And and also one task that one of the tasks that we also added, it was um, it was. Um, done as part of a, of a, a thesis uh, by by our now lead developer uh, uh, Mert, uh, it was the task of of, uh, of identifying uh, uh, different exemplars of the same images so or duplicates so, but the idea is that actually again these pictures uh, uh, the same pictures. The photography has been always um, a reproducible media, so uh, we might have a glass plate negative in one collection and a postcard from the exact same image in in another collection. And currently, these uh, these connections between the images are not existing. So um, we are using perceptual hashing for that. Uh, in order to be able to to connect those images, but at the same time, uh, users have to validate or uh, confirm these uh, duplicates. And and of course, the issue becomes more uh, tricky trickier that when um, when actually uh, in one collection the picture might have the passport two around it, uh, and and in the other it's it's like the full frame negative. So the perceptual hashing is not not working that well. Um, and um, well, was there something else? So yes, and we even actually we even implemented a very basic functionality of transcribing text, and, and this is this is a task that goes uh, that is like most distant from the pictorial content. I I um, I, I I used to stress that Iabike is meant for uh, for pictorial content. So it's mostly photographs, but it can be also paintings or graphic art. And we have also made some experiments with moving image. So uh, I mean, uh, um, to have a historic footage, and and so um, users can can geotag, for instance, uh, film stills. So you can pause the film and and put this uh, still on on the map. So in in principle, it's very. Uh, similar to to photographs, but uh, but uh, using these these backsides of the pictures, so it's um, it's uh, it's the I think the the task is is the most distant from uh, let's say if this does have a message no this one doesn't have um, <clears throat> and um, okay uh, let me quickly see I see the time is running so I I asked. I asked also many questions, uh, or not many, but I put put down some some points that what's um, what, what what I was asking that if other platforms could also uh, speak about. So let let me quickly have a look at that as well. So one was progress since launch, team affiliation. So I've I've talked about that um, it's it's run by um, 
small non-profit uh, and the team is very small uh, so um, I, I'm doing everything except the, um, uh, writing code and uh, and we usually have one at any specific point in time we have had uh, let's say one lead developer and and send then maybe also some some people more who do some kind of contributions um, to the code and we uh, we only have had the option to have a full-time developer for for 14 months uh, in, it was in 2015 mainly so when we did did a lot of progress and currently as we as as we are always struggling with uh, funding uh, so we don't have a revenue model so uh, it's uh, the idea or the model is is really wikipedia like uh, so it's meant to be a, a so common good uh, and open open for everybody open to open to um, uh, to contribute and and also open to consume the contributed uh, knowledge so uh, so there is uh, there is this uh, this uh, struggle of, of funding all all the time and i think that it's also our problem is that it's it's this kind of a basic it's a private initiative so it it's not born inside a, inside an institution so let's say it's a, like if, uh, in a, in a national archive etc so that's also that is making it more difficult to to have uh, uh, to have uh, funding for uh, uh, for sustaining it so over the course of 10 years we have received uh, public funding in the sum of uh, around 100,000 euros. Uh, so, but it's it's really, I mean, the biggest grants have been uh, 20,000 and, and then it's like 2,000, uh, 5,000, et cetera. So um, I also, I, I opened the um, Google Analytics here. So it's, it's really, it's really uh, steady. So we, we, we're not really experiencing, uh, Big growth in in the user numbers. So um, it's uh, it's uh, yes, uh, it's around twelve to fifteen thousand users per month usually, and uh, and uh, okay, let's, and so this is this is since the beginning of two thousand fifteen here. But uh, um, okay, in December it was seventeen thousand, etc. But I mean, there's there's not really there's no boomerang here or this hockey hockey stick that you uh, and and this is i think um, uh, okay if i jump to the question of uh, challenges so i think that this is uh, this is one of the big questions and and also in the in the previous talks uh, this has been addressed that uh, that how to create this user traction and engagement and uh, i think it's really it's really tricky, um, <clears throat> and and I see also that there is and over the over the course of these ten years, actually, all these the new uh, new Facebook groups popping up that are dedicated to uh, to this historic content in a specific location, and and these uh, discussions tend to take place there on these Facebook groups, and also for instance, I, although we have the commenting feature uh, so commenting is not not used so much at all so uh, so these these discussions uh, take place elsewhere and and so basically also we have had um, uh, this kind of very basic gamification since the since the beginning that actually users get some kind of virtual uh, points for all all kinds of contributions uh, and I know that this is really uh, this is important for some uh, some users and for some of our con top contributors. Okay, let me also show this graph, for instance. So this is also uh, um, this is not the latest information, but this is from last year. So, but I think it is it is really um, uh, visualizes uh, visualizes in a, a good way that actually so uh, it was. Uh, um, more than half of all the geotags submitted are uh, are by uh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, this number uh, okay. It, it, it's made by uh, f uh, 45 users. So 45 top contributors have made uh, more than half of all the geotags, for instance, uh, contributed. And so it's a typical long tail that uh, that you have less uh, less and less people who have made uh, so. From two to four geotags, or five to nine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, 
so this is this is very uh, yeah i think it's it's quite typical for all these kind of crowdsourcing initiatives that you have uh, also on in, in switzerland on snapshot there was somebody who had made 25000 or more images it's the same for our bike that we have some top contributors who have who have contributed thousands of images and and then uh, occasional uh, contributors who do one or two only and in that sense i think that uh, also one of the problems has been that our bike has been um, very uh, image centric in a way that uh, that it has been built uh, to display the images and and uh, the problem is that we uh, uh, that the user contributions have not made visible enough and this is also Vikram was presenting about the civil war photo sleuth that uh, this, oh, we have the same ideas in in the in the <clears throat> in the pipeline uh, that uh, that we want to make the user contributions more visible uh, to uh, to display the all the interactions that uh, that users have have made with the pictures so uh, uh currently it tends to be hidden we have added uh some features and also it's only since last year that we actually added the user profile uh, so that you can see individual users um, individual users uh, uh, the amount of contributions they have made etc so um but but still i think that uh, that this um, that that it is not uh, clear enough for uh, for a new random user that actually uh, these uh, these pings uh, these geotaggings have been made by somebody. So okay, here here we can see that it's it's Peter. So it's one of our top contributors, and uh, and he has let's say um, okay. Uh, uh, I'll come back to that when it. Yeah, so <clears throat> that uh, so that we can see how many. But but I mean, it's also you need to you need to know to click this, and then you can uh, can see this. So uh, uh, this is um, uh, this is something that we're really really looking into. And and I mean, also I, I think that uh, uh, the gamification. I feel that the gamification is not so important even than other other kinds of features. This kind of social interaction features. Uh, for instance, um, in the task of geotagging, so or or any task, so if if somebody uh, suggests a uh, different uh, makes a different suggestion, so you you put the picture on the map in one place and somebody corrects it, so it it would be it's very like uh, seems natural to have the first user also notified that hey somebody corrected your uh, your uh, your pin uh, do you agree with the correction or or do you want to defend your opinion so these kind of things or or we could subscribe to some places uh, to let's say subscribe to our home hometown or or even home street if there are any new pictures uh, geotag from from the street we get some kind of notification on the system etc um okay and um, um yeah, maybe a couple, couple of quick words that we are now currently working on. So, uh, as I as I told that this uh, uh, content curation is okay. Now we have Peter. Okay, so the, he is somebody who has who has suggested locations for nine nine thousand pictures, for instance, but also also other other kind of tasks. But it's one of the uh, top top uh, real top uh, re photographers. So. Um, uh, so also the question is about um, uh, adding content and that it, it might be too slow in uh, this kind of manual creation so that we want now to we are currently working on retrieving all the content from the photographic collections from this Estonian MUIS portal and also doing some initial geocoding from these uh, textual addresses uh, and and uh, the idea is to to really retrieve all these pictures and uh, and then have users uh, do this uh, more precise work of, of geotagging the exact locations and and another task that we are looking into or other is uh, and one of these um, ideas that i have is to ah it's not here that is to um, 
to start using our bike. Um, so let's say we, we have until now we have focused on the images that are already on the public in on the in the public collections in the museums and uh, uh, and that also then have some kind of descriptions etc. But I think that there is really a need for a tool in the digitization workflow. Uh, now th there are huge photographic collections, especially negative collections of photographic negatives that are being digitized and that you actually cannot really describe uh, before it has been digitized. So it's it's really hard uh, or even almost impossible to describe uh, negatives as such. So you need to digitize and invert these images in order to understand what's on the pictures. And I think that this uh, this um, process of acquisitions to or uh, and also uh, descriptions uh, needs to be opened up in in this kind of crowdsourced manner that we actually we we make a digitization, uh, we publish this content publish the content online and engage users in describing uh, organizing the content labeling and tagging, and and only then we create these uh, official <laughs> descriptions for the museum records etc. So, so yes, I think I've run out of the uh, <coughs> time. Um, uh, and Great, thank you. This please, Mia. Just some questions that have come up um, yes. so far is um, from Vikram, who's wondering if you'd studied or looked at how um, the gamification aspects like the leaderboard and point system have contributed to engaging or motivating users. And I think from my perspective, I'd add, do you know if it's demotivated some users as well? Um, uh, oh, sorry. So uh, one thing is that we <clears throat> we haven't really thoroughly studied it. So we we haven't we have we have actually made really we haven't had resources to uh, to analyze uh, most of the data that we have actually. So uh, also the usage statistics, etc. So uh, um, not really. I I know from the this kind of personal. Uh, personal contact uh, with our top contributors that uh, I mean it can be uh, uh, motivating and demotivating at the same time so uh, so there are maybe uh, so I, I know that uh, that they these top contributors they are really looking uh, uh, what what positions they are at and, and if somebody is, is getting too close and they, they may so I think this kind of this this ha does have an effect but uh, uh, but I, I believe that instead of really maybe, uh, yeah, so I would rather put more stress on this developing this kind of social features and making all this user activity more transparent uh, than, than really working on these gamification things at the moment. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question about whether the um, automatic image recognition um, what effect the tilted scans has on that? So are there factors that make it um, more or less accurate and reliable? Uh, tilt, uh, well, and with twisted images or tilted scans? That was a question from Alexander. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, I mean, we, we, uh, uh, we uh, this for this perceptual hashing, so it's, it's really, um, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, work well with with images that, as I, as I also told, that have uh, different borders around them, etc. So we don't really ha use uh, this kind of machine vision in order to analyze the pictures. And this is also one specific task that we that we really need to perform. That uh, when we have images that uh, that do have uh, uh, large borders around them, let me okay. We didn't get any randomly, but or if there is also, it, it's very common that in the museum collections, for instance, that you have the image with a color target next to the historic image, uh, and, and but but we only need the image area. So this is not, of course, this is something Triple I F uh, could do this kind of uh, regional and annotations and yeah. stuff. And and this is also something that we will want to implement. Uh, okay, I'm in the wrong. Um, uh, so uh, that uh, that we actually need to have users helping us to. Uh, okay, I mean, uh, 
the idea is to really combine uh, the machine vision and algorithmic stuff with crowdsourcing that that uh, that we could for instance edge detection use it edge detection and, and image recognition in order oh, for instance this is a nice nice example that we have a picture with this color target next to it so this is a museum record okay there is a new one now already uh, without it so this is something that we are also going to address but the idea is that that for instance also in in the task of rephotography we only want we only need to need this area we need this real uh, image area whereas currently uh, in many cases we get this uh, full picture so so first we need to identify these image image areas and then we can perform actually better uh, better search for duplicate images detecting duplicates etc so uh, I'm, there are several, several of these kind of small micro tasks that uh, that are there. Uh, and one thing, also one of the latest things that we added is uh, this kind of a basic uh, categorization. That is also, uh, 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 I mean, it's it's uh, really photography and uh, specific and also very important in the context of rephotography. That we actually want to know whether a picture is is an interior or exterior view, and then what's the viewpoint uh, level is it from a ground level from a fixed raised viewpoint or an aerial picture so for us in order to to for instance filter out images that are from taken from 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 towers or etc that we know that okay this is accessible uh, this is not and and this uh, these tasks are use or i mean or keywords um, these kind of categorizations uh, usually are missing in the, uh, the descriptions but uh, but now we can we, we, by default we consider all pictures to be to be uh, uh, ground level and exterior. Uh, but uh, but now for instance I have pictures that are taken from an elevated point of view, and of course this is also something that probably uh, now we have a lot of uh, data already um, that that could be used in order to train models and and to 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 have uh, machine learning to part of the job and have users confirm it. So this we also do not have yet. Yeah, I think that um, you know, increasingly anyone who works on crowdsourcing is really having to think hard about what kinds of workflows we can have where um, there are tasks that people are really good at, there are tasks that machines are increasingly good at, and how do we build those into systems where you get feedback from the part of the system that's really good at that kind of feedback. Um, but it requires computational resources and it requires thinking hard about the tasks that we're then offering people and how attractive they are or how interesting they are. Um, and I don't think there's any easy answers, but it's great to see so much experimentation in this area because I think that's one way that we'll get to really interesting solutions is just by trying lots of different things. Um, there's a question from Susanna about um, if you see crowdsourcing platforms as being part of an open-ended and interconnected um, information landscape versus standalone and clearly defined projects. And I think um, we're seeing a lot of convergence on platforms in this area. And it's always been a really collaborative field in terms of people sharing information and sharing lessons learned and best practices, not necessarily in published forms, but in conference papers and conversations. Um, but yeah, what, what role do you see for something like crowdsourcing platforms in a converged landscape? Mm. I, I think that there is, uh, there is still a uh, need, need for these uh, dedicated platforms. And I, I think that uh, the idea is that to connect these platforms to these repositories, uh, I mean, uh, IIIF and, and, and these kind of things uh, enable the, these uh, connections or, or uh, displaying content from, uh, from some other, other sources, etc. So, and, and we also, uh, we are willing to send this data back. Uh, but, but for instance, until now in Estonian context, uh, these official repositories have not been ready to to take back this uh, this cloud source data from us, so we we actually also have an uh, uh, API, uh, and that currently I think one of the few one of the few um, use cases is that we have uh, that um, a, a digital map a map uh, 
Estonian map portal uh, does have a specific layer for uh, for historic pictures uh, that we are providing. So if you zoom in, you get this, uh, and, and we can see the, uh, so that uh, okay, it's reloaded. So uh, we can get a preview of the picture, and and then we can uh, actually it takes us to this uh, to the page of this uh, picture on our bike, but yeah. uh, but. Um, um, I don't know if I if I answered your question, Susanna. So, um, um, so you can comment if not. But I think that speaks yeah. to something that Vikram was asking as well about um, how we think about sustainability and audiences. And I think um, drawing people to any one particular platform is a challenge because it requires a lot of work in marketing and communications and engagement. But um, putting pictures where people might already be looking and giving them the opportunity to um, do something with them is probably one good way. But do you have any other ideas about um, uh, engaging and sustaining audiences, particularly as um, the number of things that people can do online increases, um, the sort of the competition for time increases, but also um, as those tasks do change? Well, I, I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, also, actually, in a way, today, we, today uh, all these platforms that we uh, that were presenting, we are also competitors in a way. So we are also uh, competing for these audiences. So uh, Topotech is 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 present in Estonia. So National Archives uh, uh, brought it brought it uh, here. So because uh, it was part of an international project and uh, etc. So there is. Estonian content, content on on history pin, etc. So of course the question, and, but I think that and that we have we are competing. Uh, these platforms are, are compete, competing, but also I think the biggest competition is with with the social media. So uh, that uh, the thing is that people um, people have used the platform that they are on already. Uh, it's the easiest way for them. But then the question is about the data. So uh, the data on Facebook, I mean, it's also there are all these issues that also Vikram mentioned that it is unstructured. It, it is really hard to hard to track it back or even you cannot retrieve it. And I think that uh, that is interesting. I've been I, I have um, um, I have compared this uh, uh, social media to, to folklore that actually, of course, the knowledge is spreading. So if there is an old picture and there is a discussion under it, more people get to know about it. Uh, but the problem currently is that uh, this picture from the museum collection, this record uh, will not be uh, improved. So uh, in that sense, uh, these all these groups and these discussions on social media, I think uh, the knowledge is spreading, but it is still this kind of uh, tacit knowledge uh, or, or unstructured knowledge. Uh, but the, the audience is getting bigger, but, but yeah. the question is still, oh, how can we get it back? Uh, and this is a tricky question. One, actually, um, I was really, I was really uh, hoping to to get uh, a past view uh, also presenting uh, at this uh, webinar. So it's a Russian Russian project, and uh, and and so they are very. Uh, I mean, they they are very big in, and I think that probably they are the. I, I think that uh, probably they are the biggest. Uh, uh, the audience number of the uh, that the, like the monthly usage etc so uh, uh, and I think that also the commenting is very very active here on, on past view so for instance uh, okay they today have ha had 774 comments and and, and uh, etc so uh, and I think it, it's also interesting so yeah, uh, maybe I was thinking that maybe we can uh, have even uh, another webinar because uh, also the Dutch uh, Dutch portal or Dutch platform Wellehanden uh, couldn't present today, but um, but it would be interesting to to learn about them, from them. But it's interesting. It's it's I, my speculation is that for instance in Russia there are several competing social media platforms. So. Uh, there of course Facebook, but then also uh, Russian Kontakt and Anna Klasnik. So there, uh, there is no. I think, in, in, for instance, in Russian context, there is no one dominant uh, social media yeah. platform, as is the case in Estonia, for instance, where Facebook is is uh, uh, is dominating. Uh, and and maybe it is maybe it's one of the reasons why why they have more uh, like commenting activity on on their platform. I, I don't know really, but but maybe. Yeah, I think there's um, 
still more research to be done into like national cultures and how that um, affects the success or otherwise of crowdsourcing projects where some countries have a stronger volunteering culture than others and others maybe have a stronger oral history tradition that might affect um, how people feel about giving personal information on images. Um, yeah, I think that that question of audience sustainability, there's um, probably, I don't know if it's come up in earlier parts of the seminar because I couldn't listen to the whole thing, but the lockdown effect um, was very real in terms of projects that I work on where we ran out of content quite quickly at the start of lockdown in the UK and related countries because people were at home and they wanted to do something that wasn't just reading bad news about the pandemic. Um, and I think that there's a really clear role that people are passionate, but I think overcoming the barriers that make Facebook a more seductive place to spend time is a kind of, is a challenge for projects. It's a, it's a, diff, a more difficult ask than just spending time on Facebook. Um, I think just as we come to the end, I wanted to ask if there's any, um, anything that surprised you in terms of the conversations or themes that emerged in the day and if there's any like next immediate step that you might take as a result of the seminar. Let me have a look at my, my notes here also. Uh, well, if anyone um, else wants to put in the comments as well, like, you know, one takeaway they might um, have from this. Yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, maybe maybe not, not no real surprises, but I think that there were some some things also, I mean, uh, uh, that confirmed my in intuition and then the ideas that we are uh, uh, working on and also what, what Vikram was presenting about. Um, and um, uh, so, yes, I, I think, um, well, there were very many interesting interesting details and, and uh, but maybe I'm getting a bit tired as well already. <laughs> To, to bring out something uh, something really specific. Yeah. So... Um, mm -hmm. Should I hand over to you if there are any... I'm aware we're coming up to the hour. So are there any sort of closing words that you want to leave us with? Uh, uh, oh, uh, somebody... Uh, ah, okay. So, uh, James, uh, I, I, it's in private chat, so it's, it's uh, confusing. So, uh, uh, I, yeah. Well, uh, not really. I, well, I haven't thought about it. So there's definitely something that I, I forgot, uh, forgot to say. And uh, but of course, I mean, um, for me also, if we look at it. Uh, I know John also mentioned that they have been thinking about uh, what's the term, uh, sunsetting the, the historian, or uh, there have been moments. Uh, and I mean, it's 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 as it's it's really really difficult for us as well to I mean all this uh, sustaining issue. Then, but that when I when I also when I see these uh, top contributors and uh, and uh, the amount of work that they are doing, also that uh, uh, that this is, this is of course. So I mean, all these platforms they they are there only uh, thanks to the user base and, yeah. and thanks to these really uh, these. Uh, who who do this job? I mean, uh, and uh, this is also something that I I've, I've understood that I mean it's um, the uh, uh, adding content is is more or less a technical task. So uh, uh, you can um, you can easily nowadays connect yourself to these international repositories, uh, big aggregators like European or, or Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons, etc. And we could re retrieve content from all over the world. But the really the tricky part, the key question is is engaging the user base and the community, and and in that sense, of course, also I like uh, it's it's meant to be as a generic platform for uh, for this kind of um, pictorial content, but of course our main user base still is in in Estonia, and, uh, and so seventy five percent of our users are from Estonia. Yes, uh, but over the last couple of years and very important thing also that has helped us uh, to sustain us a lot uh, and i mean even yes so maybe uh, my my presentation was a bit biased in that sense that i told that we have received around 1000 uh, 100000 100, euros of grants from estonia but actually um, uh, um, since now 2 years ago we've been collaborating with wikipedia, Wiki, wikimedia finland 
So uh, Finnish Wikipedians, and then we have been uh, we have had a uh, project uh, and a grant from the city of Helsinki. So uh, Wikimedia Finland has uh, so it's uh, for a project called the Helsinki Rephotography, re and and the idea has been really to to work more on this task of rephotography. Um, um, but but, uh, but but again, I mean uh, the progress uh, hasn't been such great, so so great that uh, so it's 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 again the question of of, uh, of uh, attracting users, and I think that actually in the context of a mobile app, if I'm coming back to the question Vikram asked about gamification, in the context of mobile app, it's even more important, and I think that uh, maybe these kind of gami gamified elements are more important uh, uh, for this activity of rephotograph and mobile app. How to remind people that when you are walking around in the city, that hey, you could also take this rephotograph re here, uh, and uh, when you are working behind your computer, and, and then then it's maybe it's not so important, but really how to how to get this into the pe people's habitus uh, that uh, to take these photographs mm. this is uh, this is a tricky part so i think um the jumping back up in the comments but alexander said find people um the, the work to be done is huge and it can only be done collaboratively and i think that sort of sums up where we are as a field in a way where there's um huge challenges huge opportunities not very many resources um, but uh, we know that we're providing a useful service. We know that we're helping spend people time positively online um, while helping sort of enhance our shared cultural heritage. Um, so I think thank you for your work and thank you to all the speakers um, for their absolutely. work and, and to the volunteers and the contributors who make it worth doing. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Also, the, once more, I mean, all the all the presenters and all the moderators agreed to uh, join this event also pro bono as as a gift to Airbike. So uh, huge, huge thank you all. And uh, and uh, just the last last comment. So on the the uh, webinar was free to attend, but on the Eventbrite, uh, you can actually also uh, purchase a donation ticket. Uh, and I think uh, the sales are open. Uh, so if, if somebody found that. Uh, the um, the webinar was uh, was uh, was interesting and and uh, and uh, want to donate uh, uh, then you can still purchase this or or even uh, uh, I can also yeah so if if somebody is interested so please get in get in contact so this was a commercial uh, break in the end and and then the, the other other commercial break is that. Uh, that uh, I think it was it was so interesting today and it, it went quite well <laughs> I mean technically so I maybe I'm trying to uh, to uh, discuss with uh, with Russian uh, past few and then Velehanden and also there is a French um, uh, genealogy platform Genianet that has a very interesting uh, dedicated app for rephotography so I, uh, these are the uh, sites and platforms and apps that. But maybe we have a vol, vol two, uh, maybe a shorter version of a, uh, this kind of a webinar in the coming months. So uh, stay tuned. And I think we can conclude with that. So uh, thank you, everybody. OK, we have th uh, 34 viewers online still with us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.